we're on video, I'd like to thank my wife for allowing me to do all the planning is going on. So I get some credit for that. And I'd like to thank Paul for coming down to Southern California, putting on the great workshop for Alden. We completely changed his landscape. Joey helping a lot here today. It's going to be amazing to see that advance over the years to come with what's been done there. So without further ado, Paul giving his brand new presentation. <laughs> These guys are saying that since we're in a church, those of you in the front row might want to choose different seating for when the lightning strikes. <laughs> And then, and then they wanted to make sure that I relayed so that in Oceanside, who saw me talking in Oceanside? Few of you. So a woman asked something about, where, that's right, you know where I'm going with this. They wanted to make sure I conveyed this to everybody else. So they said, this woman, she asked, she says, well, at my church, we're, you, we're talking, we're arguing amongst ourselves about spraying the Roundup. What kind of church do you go to? That's the devil's juice. <laughs> so is that what you wanted to make sure everybody heard? <laughs> I mean, there was a lot more, but you know. <laughs> We've only got two and a half hours. We already pissed away 25 minutes getting our technical difficulties straightened out. Um, I, first of all, before I get going, as long as uh, um, we got Diego thanking his wife, I should thank my, uh, my assistant, Adrian LaPointe, who put this together, and my assistant's assistant, Cassie Rauch, who helped him. So I just sent a list of stuff to put in it, and it showed up as a PowerPoint. So I get a look, the first slide's a picture of me. <laughs> it's like, ain't that a deal? So, okay, go ahead, and I'm gonna thank Diego for being my, my click bitch. <laughs> yeah, Diego! Who, by the way, asked me how much money does it take to get me to come down here? And it's like, oh, no, no, no. See, I used to work in software engineering. You ain't going to pay that much money. And I was like, I just got too much else to do. But boy, that guy just went on and on and on until he found some way to get me to come down here. So Diego's the man. Yeah. All right, see, I got this first slide up here. And I put this at the beginning of all my presentations. And the reason is, is so that other uh, presenters will still talk to me. All uh, permaculture instructors are sweet, kind, gentle, quiet, peaceful, wise, gracious, except for tonight. <laughs> so, so an article came out. Uh, about a week ago, and, and they called me the bad boy of permaculture, and then there's a group called Occupy Monsanto, which I never knew existed until this showed up in my Facebook junk. <laughs> Somebody put it there, and I was like, oh, I like that. Ah, ah. All right, next slide. I'm gonna do the crime that no presenter should ever do, because I am the bad boy of permaculture. Most folks, I'm gonna read the slide, that's what I'm gonna do. Most folks that want change tell a dozen people how bad people should stop being bad. Over a 10 year span of time, they may have told 100 people about which bad people to be angry at. I think there's a lot of stuff to be angry at and being angry is indeed the right thing to do. And at the same time, I'd like to, I, I kind of feel like that's not time well spent. We're not making a lot of progress in that space. So I've come up with something I've done that's a little bit different. Go ahead and go to the next slide. It begins with some of my background and how I would go into corporations and resolve some of the problems. And I believe that all conflict comes from a difference of knowledge set. So when you don't have conflict, it's because the two people that are involved just happen to have the same knowledge set. So they come to the same conclusions on what we should do to solve certain problems. And then where we do have conflict, it's because they have just a different knowledge set. How they've been brought up or what they know or whatever they've learned is just different. And so their solutions to problems are very, very different. And then each one wants to tell the other how to go about solving our problems. Um, I've been playing the long game. Hundreds of tidbits of knowledge spread out over many years. So I'm trying to convey little bits of knowledge that I learned about permaculture. Ooh, here's a cool thing about permaculture. Now I'm gonna go and spread it out. Now I know it and I wanna share it with others so more know it. 
And then after each tidbit, I try to throw in the word permaculture. So if over time they see seven or eight of my tidbits, they'll say, I keep hearing about permaculture with a good thing. I'm gonna go look it up and I'm going to go and learn more about permaculture. And uh, this is my strategy for world domination. <laughs> Next slide, please. As of this moment, I've uttered permaculture to 22 million people. And I've given it to them an average of eight times each. And 22 million is not enough. Damn right. Damn right. He's, I think he said, preach it, brother. There are seven billion people in the world and some of the disasters that we have going on um, are, are affecting all of us or, or even severely affecting uh, like 10% of the population. We haven't even gotten to 10% yet. There's a lot more work to be done. And, and so then, and this is how I spend my days doing very, very boring things throughout the day in order to connect the information I've already put together with millions of people who have not yet found it. Um, I, this presentation is going to be, because I, I try to say, uh, uh, building a better world one brick at a time. I'm going to try and show you 72 bricks. I think that that's too many in one great big stream, so I'm going to do 12, and then we're going to take a little bit of a segue and do something that's a little easier, and then do 12 more, and we're going to get this all squeezed into two hours, maybe. Uh, some of these are huge. Some of these are critically important and they're kind of hard to wrap your head around, but I'm only going to try and limit myself to a minute on that topic and then move on. Uh, but some of them are tiny and really easy and they're simple little things. But the thing is, is that there are thousands of bricks. There are thousands. And this is just a taste. Um, Different people will uh, resonate with certain things and other people will resonate with other things. So, and uh, plus I've also heard that uh, nobody can learn more than three things in one day, so I expect half of you will die before this is over. <laughs> Price had to be paid. Next slide, please. Brick one, rocket mass heater. I have a Kickstarter out now. If we can get our, our uh, technical difficulties, I'll show you the video for this at the end of the presentation, after the presentation. But um, a rocket mass heater, this is something that uh, burns wood in your home. Uh, it uses 10 times less wood, one tenth the wood to heat your home than a conventional wood stove. And you would think that that would then put out one tenth the smoke. It actually puts out one one thousandth of the smoke. So um, I, if there is a cleaner, more sustainable way to heat a conventional home, I challenge all of you to come up with what that might be. There's nothing, nothing. You wanna talk about anything, any kind of pollution-based thing, non-pollution-based, um, even passive solar requires you to rebuild your home to be able to use that. So I don't think that there's anything that is better than a rocket mass here. This is, they use these things, they burn so clean, people are using these in cities where it is illegal to burn and they're completely undetected. It's not something that goes at the roof, it's a little thing that goes out the side of the wall that looks like a dryer vent. People heat their homes with just the twigs that naturally fall off of their trees. One guy heated his home all winter with nothing but junk mail. <laughs> Seventy-five percent of all home energy use is for heat. So when they start telling you the best way to save electricity is with those fucking light bulbs, they're fucking lying to you. <laughs> if they gave you a clothesline, that would save more energy than all your light bulbs. In fact, if it does save you any significant amount of energy, you're burning too many light bulbs. There's better ways to light your home. All right, now I'm just getting pissed off and going on to attention. Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, so this kind of shows a quick demonstration of what, how a rocket mass heater works. The sticks go in at the side. The fire is only on the bottom edge of the sticks. Then you get this super rockety reburn combustion chamber. Basically, you're trying to create a chimney fire for every burn. That's so much more convenient than the, the conventional wood stoves where they have a chimney fire like once every five years, but it could burn down your house. How awkward. <laughs> like, wow, well, rather than burning down my house, I could have used that heat to heat my home the rest of the year. Well, this is what we do. Then there's a mass 
it's over here, so all the hot exhaust is pushed through the mass, it heats the mass, and then what comes out of the side is, def is almost entirely steam and carbon dioxide, and it comes out at almost room temperature, as opposed to a conventional wood stove that has to push that smoke out at 300 to 600 degrees in order to get the smoke out of your home. Very efficient. Next slide, please. Oh, and look, there it is, semi-animated-ish. Yay! Ooh! Ah! Man, this audience is awesome. All right, next slide, please. The Wafati. Um, this is based upon uh, Mike Ehlers' designs uh, and John Haight's designs. This is a house that can be built in Montana and it requires no heat, none. It uses annualized thermal inertia. It's not anything passive solar or anything like that. It just uses uh, uh, the heat from the summer to heat the home in the winter. And here, conveniently, in San Diego, you could use the cool from the winter to cool your home in the summertime. Annualized thermal inertia. It's just a thermal flywheel. Um, these things look like a log cabin on the inside. Uh, if you're building it in a woodland, total cost to build the shell of the home could be as low as $200. Wow. Next slide, please. How I cut 87% off of my electric heat bill. I heated the person instead of heating the whole house. We used 80 watts of microheaters. Not some kind of heater that's at your feet that uses 1,500 watts, which sort of helps, but doesn't really. We used a variety of little tiny microheaters around the individual at a workstation, and then we set the temperature in the house to 50 degrees. Cut 87% off. Now, part of you is like, you know, what the fuck? I got a lot of money. I don't mind paying a little bit extra for heat. Well, the reason why we care is because what's on the other end of that heat source? It's, is it going to be uh, natural gas? And what's all the stuff that's behind that? Or is it going to be electricity? What's on the other end of that? Is it coal? Is it nuclear? Is it the disaster that's involved with hydropower? Those dams that they keep saying are so clean are filling up with silt behind them and it's destroying tons of habitat. Natural habitat, I mean, there's all kinds of life that used to be in these rivers and streams that has now been utterly, permanently destroyed and there's no way for it to come back as long as that dam is there. The fish ladders are a joke. So, um, if I left out any kind of power, should we cover all the environmental disasters associated with each kind of power? I mean, granted, there's some stuff about wind and solar coming up, but that wind and solar stuff wears out. And then it costs a certain amount of energy to build those and put them back. The best energy conservation, or the best energy savings, or the best way to clean our energy problem is conservation. Next slide, please. 500 hot showers from one small compost pile. So this guy built a compost pile. He put like 100 feet of half inch poly pipe in it. And then, he <laughs> Chutney has some stuff to say about this too. It's important. So then uh, uh, he's got interns. And so then this is like, you know, your intern washing station, hose them down. Then he had a PDC. He had like 25 people come to the PDC who took a shower every day. Um, so for two and a half months to three months, everybody got a hot shower, unlimited hot showers for two and a half to three months from one small compost pile. This is oftentimes referred to as the Jean Payne technique. Uh, Jean Payne did this where he built something about 10 feet high and 10 feet across. And not only did it heat his home for a year and a half because it was a much larger pile, and so they use the hot water to heat his conventional home. He also captured the gas that came off of it, the biogas, and used that for cooking. And he even used some of that biogas to run his truck. Not very far, but it did run his truck. <laughs> Next slide, please. Hugel culture. culture. Do we still have anybody here who doesn't know what Hugel culture is? Oh, we do have one person. <laughs> Soil on wood. As the wood rots, it becomes a sponge to hold water. You'll be able to plant all your favorite garden plants on your hugel culture bed, and it'll have all the water it needs through the summer without watering it at all, if you make it big enough. 
And, and usually whenever I talk about hugel culture in a presentation, the next hour and a half is devoted to what kind of wood can I use, what can I plant on it, things of that. But we're gonna skip that today, we'll do it another time. Next slide, please. Oh, more hugel culture. So this has got pictures of uh, Sepp Holzer's work up in Dayton, Montana. He put in nearly a kilometer of hugel culture beds. We had a lot of people, I mean, for a lot of the videos that I put out, there's still people who are like, that's bullshit. They, it's like right there in video, they're still saying that's bullshit. And so um, I had one video out where it showed uh, people who took a bunch of sod, they dug up a bunch of sod to be used for a garden and they piled it up and they stuck tomato plants in it and it went all summer without irrigation. But that was videoed in Seattle. And even though that summer there was only trace amounts of any kind of precipitation during the summer, it was like, oh no, that's all that the tomatoes needed to get through the summer. So that was, that was disqualified. I had another one where it was video from July and it was green and lush and they're riparian species, but people didn't recognize the plants in that as anything that would grow in their garden. So therefore that must be bullshit. So finally, I got this video. Sepp Holzer did nearly a kilometer of hugel culture beds in May of 2012 and immediately planted it full of all kinds of stuff. I came through in September, nobody had irrigated it at all and you can see all the food growing on it and you can recognize a variety of plants that people grow in regular gardens. Now all the naysayers have shut up. So this seems to be a big part of my job is dealing with all the naysayers. So now it's basically been proven. Next slide please. Paddock shift systems. Um, we're gonna talk later about greening the, the deserts, but the number one thing for greening the deserts right now, the biggest tool, I mean, one of the things that has destroyed so much land and has created deserts has been inappropriate grazing techniques. They've run animals in there in an inappropriate fashion and it's devastated the land. Or sometimes they just go in and they just cut a jungle down or cut a forest down and burn it and then run animals in there. However, the number one thing to green a desert, to, bring, to reverse desertification, and by reversing desertification, by the way, that's the number one way in order to um, heal our global warming climate change issues. The number one thing is proper grazing techniques. Nothing comes close to fixing this problem like proper grazing techniques, and that's with the paddock shift system. So here, we've got chickens. You can use chickens in a paddock shift system. Um, typically, it's done with ruminants like cattle or elephants. I mean, you're probably not doing a lot of that with elephants here, but um, Alan Savory, who started this work, started it with elephants in Africa. And uh, there's a recent, who saw the recent TED Talk with Alan Savory? Wasn't that amazing? He talks about how as a young man, he was tasked with the problem of solving desertification and came to the conclusion that there were too many elephants. And so then they went out and they killed 42,000 elephants. And then, and then it, he, saw, he talks about how that pained him greatly and he did more research and more research and more research. And now he has a technique of advocating how the elephants were actually the vital component in reversing desertification. They were not causing desertification. So now he's trying to make up for the mistake that he made as a young man. It was, it's just such a powerful TED talk. Amazing TED talk. That just came out just days ago. Um, but. Paddock shift systems are the key. Next slide, please. Diatomaceous earth. Who here has used diatomaceous earth? Oh, good. I should have asked, who here has not? Oh, beautiful, wonderful. So basically what you have here is something that's a mined dust. It, it comes, they go and they dig it out of the ground. It, it's, it's fossilized um, micro creatures and um, uh, you can go and put them on bugs and, and the bugs, uh, it scrapes off their, their waxy stuff on the outside. Sometimes it gets caught in their little exoskeleton joints and cuts them up. But usually what it does is it scrapes off the waxy coating on the outside of their um, bug body. And that's what they use to kind of keep all their moisture in because they don't go out to a drinking fountain to get water. They just collect it out of the air. And suddenly it's, they're releasing it and it takes like no time at all and they turn into like little bug jerky on the inside. <laughs> um, in the meantime, uh, we eat it. Everybody here who has ever eaten grain has eaten diatomaceous earth. The people who are trying to live to be older than 100 years old eat it every day. Who here eats diatomaceous earth every day? Every day, there's like uh, one person, two people, 
That's, uh, that's it, two people. So um, a, lot of people, a lot of people eat it in order to have thicker hair or more luxurious hair, better nails, whatever. There's all kinds of reasons that people are eating lots of diatomaceous earth every day. So it's not just the fact that you can eat it, but it also has great um, uh, health benefits also. Next slide, please. Oh, look, there's a little, they, they added in, uh, uh, Adrian added in a little something for you to look at. That's what it looks like close up. Okay, next. And then, oh, and then here's, here's, here's the graphic from my article about diatomaceous earth where it shows diatomaceous earth man stabbing a bug with a sword. <laughs> That's how it works. It's got, they got little swords. All right. Mike Ayler's $50 house. So, um, Mike Ayler's work is, is for underground homes, and sometimes he thinks that he shouldn't have called them underground homes, but earth-integrated homes. When you look at one of his houses, all you see is a hillside. They're invisible. It doesn't get much more integrated with earth than that. <laughs> um, in fact, there was a guy in Europe, he built a four-bedroom home using these techniques, and the Department of Making You Sad showed up. <laughs> And said, we hear we have a four bedroom home here. We never gave you a permit. And so we're kind of pissed about that. And then also, you need to be paying more taxes on it. And the guy was like working in his garden. And he says, well, if you can point it out to me, I guess I have to pay taxes on it. <laughs> so there's three guys from the government. And it's only two acres of land. And it's a four bedroom house. They wandered all over. They never found it. So they left. Here's, I've got uh, a couple of different videos of Mike's work, uh, but this is the $50 house. This is the original house that he designed. It was a cold, cold winter, and he knew he needed something better than the shack that he was in now. I think what he came up with was extremely brilliant. I think that the engineering in his book, and I'm an engineer, the engineering in his book is extremely sound. Not only that, but we went up to this house, and when I videoed it, the house was 37 years old, and nobody had lived in it for three years, because Mike's gotten a little up there in years, and so he lives down at the base of the hill. This is kind of up in the mountain a little bit. <clears throat> Not only was the structure extremely sound, but when I took the video, there was no odor, no smell in, in the structure, and I was worried about that, that there could be that. So, but it was rock solid. And I would think that most $50 houses would have crumbled usually the first year. Look, I made it out of cardboard. <laughs> Very sound. Next slide, please. Mike Ayler's $15 house. This one is 30 years old. When I took the video, and granted, it's a crappy video. Most of my videos are. Um, when I took the video, a couple had just moved out. A couple and a child. Three people had just moved out of this. Three people lived in this thing. <clears throat> And they had lived in there for 18 months in a, in a house that was 30 years old that cost $15 to build. To me, this reeks of freedom. I mean, if you, if you want to quit your wage slave job, then all you need is $15 and you can have a house? I mean, how cool is that? All right, next slide, please. Mike Ayler's Greenhouse. He's got this book, the Earth Sheltered Solar Greenhouse book. So up in North Idaho, <clears throat> you can imagine it might get cold there. Um, he built a greenhouse, very leaky. I mean, look at it. You can kind of see that's, that's a leaky greenhouse. That is not airtight. <laughs> and so first frost of the year usually hits about September 1. And he didn't have any additional heat source in there. And he had tomatoes in mid-December. So that's, that's extremely unheard of. So most people with greenhouses who are, who are managing any kind of greenhouse, the number one thing they're doing is how am I going to heat it? About a third of all the interest that we have in rocket mass heaters has to do with people trying to heat a greenhouse. So um, this is brilliant. This is using the, the, the temperature of the earth to do it. And he's done some very fascinating things with this. So next slide, please. And then here we have the combination. That's Ernie and Erica Wisner, the leading innovators in rocket mass heater technology. And it, they're leading a workshop there about um, 
Installing a rocket mass heater in a greenhouse, the number one thing that people want to do. Only we're trying to combine Ehlers techniques with a rocket mass heater so that way um, they can have a, a greenhouse all year. Maybe they only have to light like four or five fires throughout the year. Because when you put a fire in a rocket mass heater, the heat lasts for days afterwards. So I've got a video with Ernie and Erica about uh, a rocket mass heater in their home. And we take the video, we, we, we see the camera outside and there's snow on the ground. And uh, then we talk to Ernie and Eric and they say there's been snow on the ground every day for the last two months. Two days ago it was 19 below zero Fahrenheit. And, uh, and, and it's like, okay, well, there's snow on the ground. Uh, when was the last time a fire was put in this, in this contraption? Uh, last night at about um, uh, seven o'clock in the evening, we had a fire. And so it's currently two o'clock in the afternoon. How much wood did you use? about this much. It's not much, very little. These use very little, very little wood. So anyway, next slide please. A Rumford fireplace. So now Ernie and Erica, when they come out and they teach a workshop, they have a segment called Fire Science. And they try and show you a lot of things about fire that you probably never knew about. And this is one of them. The idea is, is that like, if you're going to have a bunch of people get together and, oh, let's have a fire. Steve brought a banjo and Ed brought this other harmonica thing and whatever else. And we got the marshmallows and we've got the hot dogs and whatever. So we're going to have a fire. Well, the thing is, is that, of course, if you sit around the fire, you're all sitting fairly close and somebody's getting smoke in their eyes. Usually it's you. <laughs> so... Uh, it's, the great thing about this is, is that you put that little wall off to one side, you can fit twice as many people around the fire in an oval and nobody gets smoke in their eyes. Here's an odd thing. If you go and you hold your hand over the fire, you know, you're supposed to like have all of your skin catch on fire and you get to watch it all melt off of your hand. But uh, actually it feels like room temperature over the fire when you use a Rumford. I mean, these are part of the lessons that you learn when you start playing with fire in weird and different ways. Next slide, please. This is gonna be our segue, fracking. So I just told you a lot of stuff about saving energy. I had a friend call me up, and he's in an area where they're doing the fracking, and he's so angry. He's going out every day to be angry about the fracking. And so they're going to government offices, or they're going to the company that's doing the fracking, and, and all this stuff, and I asked him, what kind of heat do you use in your home? Natural gas. Natural gas. <laughs> I said, dude, you're causing the fracking. This is you. If you. Who you should be talking to is all your neighbors and all the other people that are there with you being angry. And then you all need to turn off that natural gas. I've got a list of things you can use to heat your home. Now he's in Colorado, so it gets a little cold there. But I got all sorts of ways that you can heat your home without using any natural gas. If everybody, or even if 90% of the people in the area stopped using natural gas that are currently using natural gas, they'll stop fracking. They'll stop. It doesn't ship that well. Natural gas is not a great one to ship. So if it's, it's, it's a local-based thing. They're fracking because people will pay for it. Just stop giving the monster money. So most of the stuff... <laughs> Most of the stuff that I try to do is, is not about being angry at the bad guys. And so this is, so this little segue is where I'm gonna try and like share a little bit of this. I I, to me, it seemed obvious. And this guy was so passionate, but he didn't make the connection. So I guess we need to go out there and help people make that connection. It's buying it that's causing this stuff. If you want Monsanto to go away, stop giving him money. And it's like a lot of people, it's like, oh, I hate Monsanto, hate Monsanto. And the food they're putting into their pie hole is just loaded with Monsanto stuff. If you really want to, if you want to piss off, well, anyway, we're going to get to this later. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Preach it, brother. <laughs> solar food dehydrators. I think this is the best use of solar power. Um, I think I've got a slide later on why I've got some issues with the solar hot water. But when it comes to solar power, um, in fact, I, I, I recently learned, I didn't know this before, that um, most of the food that the natives collected, at least up in Montana, the folks that, uh, the native folks, the, most of the food that they collected, they, they preserved it through drying it. 
Um, I, I thought that they you know, did smoking and they did all kinds of other techniques, but it's like, no, we pretty much just dried everything, just everything, dried it. And so um, these solar dehydrators are amazing. Now, uh, the ones where the heat goes in at the top and then pushes down, those ones seem to work the best. And some people are able to build these really cheap and they'll put a lot of food in at once and that these things work so well it'll dry it really fast. So this is a, a great way to, to, to do this. Next slide, please. A double chamber cob oven. Who here has thought to themselves, one of these days I'm gonna build a cob oven? Yeah, yeah this is like a really cob common thing. Yeah, 2005 called and they want their cob oven back. <laughs> So um, the double chamber cob oven is this weird thing and, and it's like, uh, because now that we have the rocket stove stuff, they burn so much cleaner. Why would you ever want to, because it, when you look at the stuff on the left, you can see that big black splotch on it. And then this one here, this has got smoke pouring out of it. All that smoke thinks, makes me think, no, uh I'm not going to fool with that. That's damn nasty. I don't, I mean, like, we're supposed to be cleaning the air. We want cleaner air, and then we're putting all this smoke up. Surely there's something better. And Ernie Wisner, on the right there, came up with better. And it, when I videoed him, he said, no, it wasn't me. It was Kiko Denzer. And when I asked Kiko, he's like, no, it was all Ernie. And then I go back and I talk to Ernie and he's like, well, okay, I probably did do most of it, but Kiko kind of made a suggestion. So it's Ernie, he's just too damn humble. So um, he came up with something where it has two chambers. One is the main regular cob oven chamber and the other one has got some rockety stuff. You can kind of see the flame shooting out of the top right there. So it's got some of the rockety stuff. It's not as clean as our rocket stuff but it is really, really clean. And as he takes the door on and off, you can see it go from smoky like your regular cob oven to like burning very clean again. So, um, uh, but the thing is, is that if you're gonna do a cob oven, this is the one you wanna look at. And um, I, I convinced, er for years, Ernie and Erica, uh, they just gave all the information away for free. And they would send Erica off to work these lame ass minimum wage jobs to make ends meet. And so I said, you gotta stop doing that. You guys need to be working on rocket mass heaters all the time, not going to some lame minimum wage job. So I asked them to make plans and they've made plans for their double chamber cup oven and some of their rocket mass heaters and you can buy those plans. And I'm proud to say that they are no longer working at some suck minimum wage job. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is Brian Kirkbliet at Inspiration Farm in Bellingham, Washington. And uh, uh, one of the things is, is that if you harvest grains, if you have grains at home, it's like you probably aren't going to go out and buy a $500,000 combine and park it in your driveway. I mean, it would be kind of cool. You can tell the neighbors like, yeah, that's my combine, all right. <laughs> What's your combine like? Oh, you don't have one? <laughs> yes, I grow my own grain. Thresh it with this combine. Takes me 12 seconds. So the thing is, is that for smaller stuff, you could get a smaller thresher, but those would be like $20,000. So bra and then the other thing was, is like a, you could use the old school approach where you would beat it with sticks. <laughs> A long time. It was, it was like, grew, and of course back, you know, uh, 200 years ago, uh, threshing grain, it was like, when it was your birthday, you would get a birthday cake because that cake is like, you know, today's money, that's a hundred dollar cake you're getting. The idea that you're eating grain, this is a very rare thing. But thanks to the combine and uh, farm subsidies, then we all get to have all kinds of grain-based things for really cheap now. Five. What? Pie. Pie and pie. Oh, geez, pie. I got a pie today. <laughs> and I get to have it when I'm done here. So we're going to hurry this up. <laughs> so Brian Kirkbliet came up with two different designs for a do-it-yourself grain thresher. One featured a plastic bucket and a drill. And I was amazed at how fast it worked. I mean, when you've tried beating grain with a stick, and then you see this, that was awesome. 
And then he's got this other contraption. It's, it's a converted wood chipper, which, you know, I hate wood chippers. I'm totally against them. But, but here he's got an electric wood chipper, and it threshed that grain mighty quick. What an awesome thing. And in that same video that I have, this is from a video I took that's on YouTube right now. From that same video, he also does winnowing. Pretty, you made the pie for me, didn't you? Yes, you did. I'm going to eat it in like an hour. Yes. <laughs> so, next slide, please. Convert roadkill to chicken feed with the help of maggots. Now, here's a cool thing is that when I put up these videos, then of course I get all kinds of hate. I get gobs of hate. But I also get some really interesting information. So one of the things I learned after putting this up, because this is also at Brian Kirkliet's farm, is that whenever anything would end up dead for whatever reason, he just puts it in there with a little bit of straw. And my number one rule, uh, I heard a thing earlier about urine stuff. And, and I kept wanting to like raise my hand and say, and now I want to take over your presentation and do it my way. But uh, I didn't, I did a pretty good job. I kept pretty quiet. So, um, but I think one of the rules for farming or for permaculture is if you smell anything, you're doing it wrong. If it stinks, you're doing it wrong. I mean, by smell anything, like if you smell pie, you're doing it right. But, but if it stinks, it's like damn nasty, you're doing it wrong and you need a different system. So I was very concerned about the system, but I, I'm here to tell you there was no smell. No smell at all. Because I was thinking like, no way am I gonna ever do this because it's gonna smell damn nasty. It smelled fine. It was, it was perfectly good. Now I've heard now that um, there is some kind of a pathogen that the maggots will carry from the, the, the rotting creature uh, out to the chickens. Because the maggots just fall out the bottom of the bucket and the chickens pick it all up. But uh, there's some kind of disease, and so I think it's botulism. But then, um, uh, so yeah. <laughs> Something you want to go easy with, right? <laughs> so um, after creating this video, I've learned that black, folger, uh, black soldier fly larvae are far superior. And so I have yet to get that video, but um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. In the meantime, this video is up, but it's, it's a very similar concept. Next slide, please. A walk-in refrigerator made with a small insulated room and an air conditioner. So there's a, that, that little contraption off to the side here has a special name. It's called a, a cool bot. And basically it, it tricks the air conditioner into thinking that the room's too hot. So the air conditioner comes on and cools the room some more. So this guy created a cheese cave. This is, this is what it's called. But it, you can see on the thermometer it's like 42 degrees in there. And um, so we made this video and we're talking about how you can kind of have like your own little walk-in refrigerator for really cheap. I'm not sure what the energy costs are like, but it's the same kind of concept for running a refrigerator and he's got a much, much larger space. However, apparently the CoolBot people spotted this and then they contacted the guy and now he's guaranteed a CoolBot for life. <laughs> So I, I, a lot of the people in my videos get little perks like that when we, uh, so I like doing that, but uh, I like it when that happens. But next slide, please. A scythe, here's Brian Kirkliet. And it's like, uh, in this video, he just demonstrates how simple it is to use a scythe. And it's like, if you ever just get a scythe and then you're like going around and you're like, I'm gonna hack at things and stuff like that, it totally doesn't work. I mean, there is just this tiny bit of knowledge that you need to make it really sing for you. And then in the video, Brian tells the story about a tiny teenage barefoot lass who, com who had a scythe and competed with a strapping young lad with a weed whacker, a power weed whacker, the most powerful weed whacker there was. And they had a race. And, and I actually found the YouTube video for that, and it is really cool. And it's like, uh, uh, and she won. She won with the size. She, she was able to do more than the weed whacker guy, the string trimmer guy. And then of course there's the other thing too. So as he's doing this, he's wearing, I think he's wearing flip flops or something. He's got sandals on. And then half the comments are, he's gonna chop his toes off. <laughs> And it's like, no, see the blade is over there, your toes are over here, it doesn't come anywhere near that. And it's like, uh, no, what, what you need to do is that, and he pointed out in the video, is if you got a string trimmer, you need full-on pants because you're going to have slug guts all over your legs at the end of the day. 
And so then, of course, you know, he's talking about when you run that string trim, you're waking up, keeping all your neighbors awake and stuff like that, and it's loud and it stinks and it stinks. Ah, not a good thing. So makes it very obvious and simple. And we have a second video up that's how to sharpen them with, a, you know, peening them and stuff. But just needs a little bit of care, a little bit of knowledge, and it'll sing for you. Next slide, please. Slug control with a pile of rocks. <laughs> now, I don't, do you guys, yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> does this guy, how stupid does this guy think we are? <laughs> you said that, didn't you? No, no, okay. You, you said this. Okay, okay. What? What? Do you guys have much of slug problems down here? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> snake habitat. It's snake habitat. And so whenever, so basically we, in the video, I, I, I talked to Jacqueline Freeman. Who's heard the podcast with me and Jacqueline Freeman? Nope. Real? Do I not have pod people? Who, who listens to my podcast? A lot. Okay, you just haven't gotten to that one yet? Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, this one gets a lot of feedback because then everybody totally falls in love with Jacqueline because she talks about the spiritual element on her farm, which is like something I don't normally cover in my stuff. So, um, but anyway, she talks about the piles of rocks. Wherever they put in the piles of rocks or the piles of brush, all the slugs have disappeared. And it's not, I mean, it's, it's not just the snakes. There's lots of other creatures and there are lots of other predators. But when you get to a garden and it's flat, and it's sterile and it's just got your lines of stuff. It's kind of like um, you've made it very unnatural. So what did you think was going to happen? So now we're bringing in these brush piles and these piles of rocks and it has lots and lots of slug predator habitat and the slugs just disappear. Garter snakes eat slugs. Make habitat for garter snakes. I mean, before I said you're going to control slugs with a pile of rocks. And the response was, what the fuck? And, and now, now that I've pointed out that it's habitat for the snakes, well, duh. <laughs> I mean, I feel like most of the stuff that I present, people are like, that's impossible until I show a video of it. And then it's like, well, duh. <laughs> so this is like, so like, like with the workshop we did for three days. I think at the beginning, it's like, how the hell? And at the end of it, it's like, well, duh. <laughs> So obvious. Yeah, you put a swale here and a pond. <laughs> Duh. Next slide, please. <laughs> Colony collapse disorder. Did you know that we still have this? It's still going on. We're losing like 30 to 40% of all of our bees every year. And, and yet this video that I made is now three years old. And it's, it makes it completely obvious what causes it. And there have been a couple of uh, full-on uh, full movies that have come out to explain it. One was covering a particular kind of pesticide, and that would be vanishing of the bees. And Queen of the Sun kind of was close to mine. But in mine, it basically said, stop, stop talking about the viruses and the funguses and, and the pesticides. It's just, it's just all of it. So I get, we go through a list of 12 different things. And it's like, if you're just attacking the bees with one or two different things, they can deal with that. But then when you start hitting them with 9, 10, 11 things, it's like they can't cope. It's too much. So if you just were coming at them with pesticides, okay, we can cope. If you're coming at them just with moving them thousands of miles several times per year, they can cope. But when you start adding it all up, they can't. So we got all this investigation going into what virus exactly is it? What fungus exactly is it? That's, that's not what we should be looking at. Just stop stressing the damn bees and they'll be fine. <laughs> Next slide, please. So this is a quick and easy one. These guys rolled into Missoula from the East Coast and they all had kitty litter buckets as panniers on their bicycles. And, and so, I mean, I've heard of people making uh, uh, panniers out of kitty litter buckets, but these guys have just gone 3,000 miles and, and they're, they're reporting, no, they, they can, this is like nothing, nothing. They can keep going. We had to replace some duct tape once because the, part of the construction is a little bit of duct tape. And it's like, yeah, the duct tape wore out, but the buckets are still going strong. We could probably get another 20,000 miles out of these babies. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
Cobb houses. Who here does not know what Cobb is? One person, two, three. It's, it's mud. <laughs> you now, granted, you kind of want to get just the right kind of mud. Just the right, a little bit of clay, a little bit of sand, sometimes straw, mash it together, and you can pretty much shape it in anything you want. And the great thing about a cob house is that in a weekend workshop, <clears throat> you can learn everything you need to build your own home. And at Cobbville, they teach that. You just go down there, spend one week in there, you kind of mush around with a cob and kind of make some stuff, and they give you all the information that you need to be able to go home and make your own house out of cob. Now, cob, ha cob is beautiful. You can, carve, you can shape it into anything you want. And everything that they have at Cobbville is a work of art. And it's just, it's just beautiful. You're living in art. How, you know, it's, that's the best way to live. However, it takes a long time. <laughs> it's just slow going. But, the, but the, the, upsides, the upsides are fantastic. Next slide, please. A cast iron skillet. This is, this is some old technology. The funny thing is, is that, and this started off, this was like my very first video because I got very frustrated because I was sure that there were people out there that could get an egg to slide around on a cast iron skillet every time. But I could get an egg to stick to a cast iron skillet every time. So um, I, I went and I just, I spent probably hundreds of hours combing through the internet, asking questions in forums and stuff like that to try and, and get it to, to, to work better for me. Um, and then I would write this article and then I had lots of people give me more and more feedback on the article and finally, after years and years and years, I finally got to the point where I could get the eggs to not stick every time. And then I had people tell me that I was lying. <laughs> So I made the video to show that the egg was sliding around on the cast iron skillet. And so that was my very first YouTube video. Um, but I just want to, and so now the article, I think if you go and you Google cast iron, I think it's like number three or four or something like that. Or the, the, the yeah, so anyway, the thing is I've got an entire article out there that goes into a lot of detail about just the few little tidbits of information that you need in order to get a cast iron skillet really sing for you. It will last hundreds of years as opposed to that non-stick stuff, which is extremely toxic, which will be, need to be replaced every six months or so. Next slide, please. Lawn care. This is my first article. And, and this is kind of uh, part of what, a little bit of what got me going into permaculture, I guess, in a way, or at least, at least the save the world mode that I'm in. And that is that um, I, I, I taught a little class, a little workshop on lawn care, on organic lawn care. And then uh, 1995 rolled around and we had this new thing called the internet. And I thought I'd try it out and I put my little lawn care article on there and all the search engines picked it up and everybody came to it. And it, at some point in time I realized I was convincing people that were on their way to go and buy weed and feed to not buy weed and feed. Mostly because I was the only lawn care article on the internet at the time. <laughs> Um, and, and then I ended up still being number one, and at some point in time I kind of realized, wow, you take the number of traffic and then the number of emails that I get from people saying that, that I've changed them for life, that they're never going to buy weed and feed again. Because I, I advocate that the idea is, is that um, if you give up the weed and feed, not only can I cut the amount of mow time by a factor of three, and I can cut your water time by a factor of five, but on top of that, you can grow cool things in your lawn. So you can grow yarrow, which feels good when you walk on it barefoot. Or you can grow chamomile, which smells like green apples when you mow it. Or you can grow crocuses so that when winter is over, which you probably have no idea what winter means, <laughs> your lawn is a whole bunch of flowers and that the flowers, by the time that they're all done, the grass starts to grow. So by the time you get to the first mowing, the flowers are gone. So you've got all these cool things. You can, you can plant edibles in your yard, a mowable meadow. Um, I also want, so anyway, I found, I figured out that I was um, saving the world from train loads of toxic gick, like entire trains loaded with toxic gick by the number, by the amount of traffic, because there's a lot of people that came onto the internet and, and looked for lawn care. This was getting massive traffic. And that's what led me to thinking like, wow, I've made a, I made a difference. 
And what more can I do? And that's why I wrote the cast iron stuff. I'm gonna figure this out and I'm gonna make it so people don't go and waste their money on that toxic git cookware. But now there's an organization called Grow Food Not Lawns. And a lot of permaculture people are kind of in that space like, like oh, I don't wanna have any lawn whatsoever. But I wanna point out that I like the idea that we can still have a place where community can come together and have a picnic or where, where children can play or where we can have a yard sale. A yard sale is a very permaculture thing in my opinion. And so I think that the thing to do is, yes, grow food and lawns. And that, granted, there are properties where there's way too much lawn and we could do with a little bit less. But also I like the idea of calling it a mobile meadow perhaps. So I don't want to give up on the lawn. Next slide, please. Oh, here we go. Oh, segue. So about four years ago, three years ago, I needed to express something and I needed a tool. I needed to talk about a problem that I saw and so I developed, I just made this up. I, I called it the Wheaton Eco Scale. You all can make up your own scales. I don't care. You, I mean, you can, once you make up your own scale, you can call it whatever you want. You can name it after yourself. You can give it different properties based on what you think is cool. At level zero, there are six billion people. At level one, there's one billion people. At level two, 100 million people. So 10 times fewer people at each level. And it goes on and on and on until you finally get to level 10, and that's Sepp Holzer, the mighty, the glorious, the amazing Sepp Holzer. So um, there's a lot of, and then it's, it's an eco scale. So then, like, the people at level one um, are like, I'm going to be better on the planet, so I'm going to go buy some light bulbs. And then at level four, people are saying, I'm going to be better to the other people on the planet, so I'm going to get rid of all those damn CFLs. Um, but uh, somewhere around level three, you might start raising a garden, probably organic, and then um, somewhere at level five or so, you might take a PDC. At level seven, you might teach a PDC. And so then, uh, so this is the scale. Now here are the properties that I needed to express. Is that no matter what level you are, that the, that the common mentality is, and this is one of the things I want to correct, the common mentality is everybody behind you is fucking everything up and has to stop. And you're going to run down there with a baseball bat and smack them to get them to stop screwing everything up. Another observation is, is that anybody that's like one level ahead of you is cool. Anybody that's two levels ahead of you is really cool. Anybody that's three levels ahead is crazy. Anybody four or more levels ahead is so crazy they need to be institutionalized for their own safety and the safety of others around them. And we're going to get to one of those here in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So later, I think it was a year ago, I watched this movie called The Age of Stupid. Who's seen The Age of Stupid? I think it's, I, I think it's a really good movie. Um, but it was a funny thing is that in the movie, there's one person who's like advocating, let's put up these wind power things, you know, wind, so, so we'll get electricity from wind. And he calls himself an environmentalist. And then um, there's this other woman that's, that's in the movie, and she says, no, we shouldn't do that. And, and she's also an environmentalist. We must do that which is good for the environment. So it was environmentalist versus environmentalist. And I kind of thought to myself, you know what? I think that there's a lot of people, and I think that this was part of the point of the movie, is to say that there's a lot of people who call themselves an environmentalist because that's what's convenient. They think they're going to get leverage out of that. So... I, using all the authority that I have, as the largest voice in the permaculture world, so maybe not everybody knows this, but I give away more free information on permaculture than all other permaculture people combined. Yeah. So I am the voice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Jeff Lawton has dubbed me the Duke of Permaculture. So, using whatever lordly power that I have, I came up with this test. Actually, I came up with the test before I got named Duke. But I just, for whatever reason, for anybody, for any authority that I might possibly have, I came up with this test. And so basically, I wanted to be able to say that certain people, I'm gonna take away their license to call themselves an environmentalist. And you might be shocked because half of you in this room might be about to lose your license to call yourself an environmentalist, but you don't have to say anything. You can just keep it to yourself, all right? 
A proper test would fill a library. If we're going to examine every speck of your life for all the different choices that you make and whether you have a garden or not or whether you give money to some organization or not, well, you know, it would fill a library. And then the debate that it took to fill that library would probably fill a hundred libraries. But I've just come up with a quick and simple thing. The average American spends about $1,000 for heat and electricity per adult per year, or $250 for electricity without heat, because the heat is taken care of with something other than electricity. So the test is simple. Spend less than average. I mean, basically half the population spends more than average, and the other half spends less than average. All you have to do to hold on to your license to call yourself green or eco or an environmentalist or a permaculturalist is to spend less than average on electricity. So then do your own math in your heads and then, you know, I think half of you are going to be ashamed of yourselves and you should be. This is important. The stuff on the other end of that wire is damn nasty. And this is, this is the key. You've got to walk the talk. So, in that particular movie, the woman who would fly up to deal with this crap for her summer home several times a year in order to stop the windmill project, she loses her license to call herself an environmentalist. The guy who wanted to put the windmills up and actually used hardly any electricity in his home, he gets to continue to call himself an environmentalist. This is really important. So now, granted, this is just my test, other people can come up with their own tests, etc. But, next slide please. A tiny house for $362. Um, uh, so I, I had to, um, these people built this house in a place where it, it might not be okay to have a tiny house. There's an interesting video on YouTube where somebody builds a tiny house and what they do in order to make it legal is they, get, they, they, they submit a design for a much larger house because the smallest house that you're allowed to build is something like 1,500 square feet in this particular county. So what they do is they get this um, permission to build a much larger house and then mysteriously after they built just one little part of it, they ran out of money. <laughs> Oops, but <clears throat> this one, this one uh, never got that permit. Um, uh, most of the cost of the $360 is for the wool insulation. But when you live in a really tiny house, you don't need a lot of insulation. So um, anyways, there's a quick little video. Next slide, please. Masanobu Fukuoka. One of the superheroes of permaculture who died a little while ago. In fact, uh, just recently uh, was his 100th birthday if he were still alive. I think he died at the age of 96. But um, this guy in Japan had rice production in the top 5%. So a lot of people have said, and this is, this is something where it's like, uh, you know, I, I still hear it. I still hear it in permaculture circles and I have to stop this. And people will say, oh, it's too bad that we are required to use petroleum fertilizers because without them, three quarters of the world's population would die. Utter horseshit. <laughs> Steaming, festering pile of horseshit. <laughs> Fukuoka proved it to be so. His rice production was in the top 5% for all of Japan. And there's more. From that exact same field that the rice came off of every year, while the neighbor's field was fallow, just sitting there doing nothing but turning into a big mud pie, Fukuoka also pulled off a crop of barley. So I think his food production was what? Double the average? I think that we can feed people without petroleum. And his primary tool was not tilling. Next slide, please. Earth berm pig shelter cuts feed costs. So basically, this is a Sepp Holzer style uh, uh, shelter 
the pigs are in here. Um, and then the fact that they can stay warm on a cold day makes it so that they don't need to eat as much food. That's all that's up to this video. Uh, recently, there was something on here about, uh, uh, somebody posted a comment on the video about how the pigs are not fenced in at all. And that, oh great, thanks, you just made feral pigs. And my response to them was, oh great, thanks, you have no fucking idea how to raise pigs. <laughs> I mean, if you know what you're doing, the pigs do not run off. And I think that's an important thing too, that's a good sign that you know what you're doing when you're raising hogs, is that the pigs like to hang around with you. Next slide, please. Refrigeration without power. <laughs> this is kind of funny. All it is is like this like 100-year-old refrigerator box that doesn't work anymore, and they just put some PEX tubing in it, and then they connected it up to their spring, and then the water naturally gravity-fed through this thing and kept it spring cold. And then um, half the comments on this were that it's not possible because it's, it's not without power because you have to use power to pump the water through it. Apparently, they don't understand how gravity works. <laughs> So, no power, there's no power used whatsoever, there is no pump, it's gravity fed. Next slide, please. A home made from a $1,700 shipping container. Where's Jocelyn? There she is. So, so we go to this farm and we're visiting this farm and they've got this here and, and Jocelyn, oh there's a picture of her right there. And so Jocelyn says, oh we should video this. And I'm like, no, it's just this stupid house that they made out of a shipping container. It's like ugly and things like that. And it's like, so it was cheap, you know, $1,700 isn't that cheap. We've seen cheaper. And, and it's kind of like, she's like, well, I'll just take it and then you can throw it away later. So I took the video, I ended up putting it up on YouTube and it ended up being one of my all time most popular YouTube videos. <laughs> So that means it's a vector where people learn about my empire. They come and they watch this video and then they come in and learn about everything else. Who learned about my empire through this video? Nobody. Okay, fine. <laughs> they paid $1,700 for an insulated shipping container. And, and then the thing is, is that where they were, then of course it's totally against code to do anything like this. So they left one side of it kind of looking like a shipping container, which a lot of people in their neighborhood would get a shipping container and just use it for storage. So, from the outside, it just looked like somebody had a shipping container on their land, they're using it from storage. But you go around the other side, and they've kind of made it out to a nice little house. And, and inside, I thought it looked nice inside. It looks fine. They had windows and stuff like that, and it was okay. See, it looks like a shipping container. And then, now, oh, it's like a, it's this metal thing. The, the insulation that they use in these, because it's a refrigerated shipping container, R35. It's almost the same as straw bale. Next slide, please. Sepp Holzer's bone sauce. So I don't, do, you, do, do people here have much trouble with deer on their fruit trees? So one person does. <laughs> Two people, three, four. <laughs> so the idea is, is that you go through this process and you end up with this goo. And then you go and you put the goo on the tree and it keeps deer off of that tree for decades. So there's been other solutions where people have come up with different kinds of things that you might put on a tree. And the idea is, is that it's going to keep the, uh, the deer off of the tree, but they don't say how long. Usually until it rains. Sometimes a day. <laughs> but this is, this is 10 years. And now um, we've got a video where Sepp Holzer actually makes it. And um, then we have a whole bunch of people on permies.com that did it and tried it and they said, yes, it works. It keeps the deer off. And this is in places where they have very high deer pressure. Next slide, please. Oh, here we are making the bone sauce. You've got cast iron pots. You fill it up with bones. Next slide, please. In just the right way, you heat it up and then you cool it off. And then there's goo at the bottom. And then what Sepp Holzer likes to do, so if you ever meet Sepp and he makes this, he puts it on the end of the stick and he gives you an opportunity to smell it. And just when you get in the range, he goes, bloomp. <laughs> so it's on your nose. You're going to drive away deer for decades. You might drive away the opposite sex too. Unless, unless they like barbecue because that's kind of what it smells like. Actually, it smells like a barbecue grill that hasn't been cleaned in 10 years. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
apple tree from seed and not printing. So both Sepp Holzer and Fukuoka came to the same conclusions without knowing about each other's stuff. And that is, grow your apple trees, and this goes for any fruit tree really, um, uh, without any pruning whatsoever. And you end up with, with branches along the ground. Not this lollipop thing, this artificial lollipop, where you've got this trunk and then branches. That's, we refer to that as a lollipop look. So no, have branches along the grounds. There's a variety of reasons. We go into a lot of detail about that at Permies. Sepp goes into it on his books. I, I think Fukuoka talks about it a little bit too. But the other thing is, is to start your apples and all your fruit from seed. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But you know, a lot of people say, oh, only one in 20,000 will turn out into an, an, an apple that you can eat. That's not true. Only one in 20,000 will turn into an apple that can compete on the open market with things like Macintosh. So it'll have to be something that's better than Macintosh. So only one out of 20,000 will be better than Macintosh. I'm here to tell you that 20% of the apples that will come from that seed, assuming that you started with a good seed, like you started with something from an apple that was delicious, 20% of those will turn out to be delicious. 20% will be delicious. 20% will be a variety that we refer to as a spitter. So um, you might call it damn nasty. <laughs> but you know what? Those seeds, you get like anywhere from five to a dozen in every apple. If you get a tree that comes up and it's a spitter, cut it down. Turn it into hugel culture. <laughs> and then the rest of the apples, the other 60% of apples that you'll get will usually be an okay apple. Good for sauce or good for pies or good for one thing only. Maybe not particularly for fresh eating or something like that. Next slide, please. Dan Rojas, Mosquito Trap. Who's been to the YouTube channel called Green Power Science? A few of you? So this is Dan Rojas. And uh, he's got this amazing thing. You guys, you guys have mosquitoes here in San Diego, right? Yes. Yeah. You haven't made a law against them yet? <laughs> so um, basically, it's just such an incredibly simple thing. He just sets up a fan that has a metal housing and then he puts a screen on it and attaches the screen with little magnets. That's it. <laughs> just the thing just packs, you know, he runs it all night and it just, it's just packed with mosquitoes the next day. I mean, no spraying of toxins or anything like that. No having to rub weird goo on your skin. Um, just, just that. And it's like, you know, there are times when it's like, oh no, here comes mosquitoes with scary things. I mean, you've heard about the mosquitoes that they're now loading up with, um, like, what is it? Uh, um, antiviral, what, no, wait a minute. It's like, uh, in case you haven't gotten your shots or you haven't put your kids through, the, oh, the vaccinations. We're gonna vaccinate your children for you by turning mosquitoes loose. No. Yes. Oh, that's bad. Oh, yeah, that's bad. But fuck you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, really? I mean, you, and it's like, no, no. We know it's like killing you, but we think that's funny. <laughs> so uh, uh, maybe you're thinking, boy, I'd like to control the mosquitoes around my house. Yeah, here's a thought. <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, Farmstead Meatsmith. Who has seen the three half hour videos, the Farmstead Meatsmith videos? You know, I, I think, I, I, I'm not certain of this, I haven't heard of this yet, but I would imagine that if vegans watch those and listen to the podcast with the, that I made with this guy, you might let go of the vegan thing. <laughs> I mean, it's like there's this amazing, beautiful art in developing a relationship with the animal and then at the, at the same time, there is the, the ability to have a beautiful relationship with the animal as the animal is harvested, and then as you use every bit of this animal. And uh, the poetry that seems to go in behind this is just stunning. The idea of like this, this, this chopping block is, um, is like no bleach ever touches it, which is totally illegal, and that Basically, there are certain kinds of um, fermenting bacteria that build up in the chopping block, so effectively all meat is fermented. When I recorded the podcast with this guy, he had two hams hanging in his kitchen that were at that time only 18, I think it was 18 months old. Was it eight? 
How old? Well, they were, what? <laughs> oh, you don't remember, okay. <laughs> I, think, I think that they were only 18 months old and he was waiting until they were a full three years old before the, they would be fully into flavor. I mean, such amazing meat preservation by just um, by hanging it properly and having some knowledge from hundreds of years ago about how to properly ferment and preserve meats. It's, it was, it's just, it's, it's like one of, the, one of the coolest things that I've learned in years. Next slide, please. Raw milk. Okay, you wanna give the bad guys a kick in the nuts? You wanna, you wanna give, this is big pharma. So like if you've watched, who's watched the movie Farmageddon? Oh, yeah. So now we, we saw the SWAT team come in and hold children at gunpoint. Big fucking machine gun right in their face. Not, the safety's not even on. Can splatter this kid's brains all over the wall with a sneeze. And, and this is a 40, 40 soldiers fully armored and wearing armor. And they're coming in and they're going, they're holding these children at gunpoint and the families at gunpoint while they kill their animals and then give them a lye bath. The lye bath makes the animal 100% dissolve. Then they claim that the animal had some bizarre made up disease, but you can't prove it because the animal has been dissolved. Why? Why would they do that? Raw milk. Raw milk. What happens if you have some simple food like raw milk and you drink it and your cancer goes away? Or you drink this raw milk and 80% of the ailments for which there is currently a mega pharma industry goes away. That's why they do it. You're able to buy raw milk in this area. I've been putting raw cream in my coffee every morning while I've been down here in San Diego. Um, just pick it up at, uh, what's that grocery store we've been going to? We've been going, Jimbo's. We've been going to Jimbo's. But I guess, is it at Sprouts too? Yep, yeah, yeah. Drink your raw milk. You know, a lot of people are going around and they're saying something about how uh, they're lactose intolerant. No, you're not lactose intolerant. You're pasteurization intolerant. <laughs> Try it. Try it and see. You know, makes your innards real sad? Go drink a whole bunch of raw milk and see if it makes your innards sad. Try it. So I've got a podcast with Sally Fallon Morell from the Weston A. Price Foundation. And we go into all sorts of details about raw milk. And it's profound. It's profound what's being done against it politically. And it's profound what this stuff can do for you. Next slide, please. <laughs> this was a funny thing. So last October, so we've got this, this Kickstarter campaign going on right now where we're trying to sell four DVDs through Kickstarter. And this is my project, give me money. I want this to hit $100,000. Go buy my damn DVDs. But we're at this event, we're recording everything. And um, uh, we, we do this thing where we do a turkey cooker next to a rocket stove. Which one can heat this, this huge amount of water the fastest? And we get the rocket stove to win, yay! And then we, this fellow shows up, Mark Vandermeer, he's kind of like a permaculture guy without the label, uh, up in the Missoula area, and he stops by and he's also a part-time blacksmith. And he's looking inside and says, I think that that's hot enough to be able to melt some steel. So we try it, just on a lark, and sure enough, look at how orange that is. So, and that's like, and, and then Mark was saying that in his forge, it would take several minutes to get that orange. That's after like 25 seconds. We get these things burning that hot with just twigs. And he's like, what, there's no fan? I mean, I can do this with just twigs. I don't have to go buy coal. I don't have to run a fan. I could do this anywhere. So um, uh, just for, for what it's worth, a, a little poor man's uh, a foundry. Next slide, please. An electric tractor, Steve Heckeroth. This is up a, a little bit north of uh, San Francisco. And uh, so Steve Heckeroth uh, is an engineer. 
He uh, worked on some of these projects to create an electric car battery. Uh, they totally solved it. They had an awesome electric car battery and their company got bought by Texaco, which then got bought by Chevron. That's a clue to two companies that you do not buy your petroleum from. They're sitting on it. They're sitting on it. So, you know, electric cars could go a lot farther now and they can charge a lot faster, but they're sitting on it. They got the patent and they're sitting on it. So Steve was one of the inventors of it. Uh, this particular electric tractor, this is his version 12. The great thing about an electric tractor compared to an electric car, with an electric car, if you're going to go for a long drive, you're going to, you know, you got to find a new charging station. But then with an electric tractor, you're never far from your charging station. If you use lead acid batteries, which, by the way, um, are very easy to recycle, then the problem with an electric car is that they're very heavy. So you don't get to go as far. And there's all kinds of problems with having something that heavy. However, with an electric tractor, all that weight gives you extra traction, something that you want. In fact, with normal tractors, they fill the big tires in the back, they fill those with a liquid solution to give them extra weight. So now you don't need to do that. There, look right there, that's the solar panels. That's a particular kind of solar panel that Steve invented. So this is a YouTube video of mine. I've also got like six podcasts with Steve talking about a variety of things. And um, I, I've got, oh, and I've also got, in fact, I think it's coming up. I've got another thing coming up with Steve in it. But next slide, please. Oh, we're back, we're back to a segue. Um, when Sepp Holzer did what he did, he didn't call it permaculture in the beginning. Eventually, Bill Mollison came to his property and said, this is the best example of permaculture in the world. We hope that you will call what you have permaculture. And so then Sepp liked the word, so he started calling his stuff permaculture. Um, in the meantime, David Holmgren, who had disappeared from the permaculture world for a while, came back and, and he wrote some books and talked about it. So then um, we've got basically a couple of different approaches to permaculture. One is where a lot of permaculture, like the PDCs, start with the ethics, the three ethics. So you've got uh, care of the people, care of the earth, and return of surplus to the first two. And so David Holmgren came up with um, a, a more rhymy way of saying it. He called it earth care, uh, people care, fair share. It rhymed. And so um, they came up with this fair share, which, by the way, he shows here in, in this image as um, pie. <laughs> So you would think I'd be really excited about it, but actually at permies.com, um, I would say that uh, a lot of the problems that we have with problem people who come and, and um, uh, are doing awful things usually has something to do with that fair share thing. Um, they interpret fair share to mean that it's okay for them to steal other people's stuff and give it away. Kind of like this whole Robin Hood thing. So you've got Toby Hemingway has written this really nice book and they think it would be awesome to take the book, put it into a PDF format and give it away to everybody and then uh, Toby gets to watch his sales dip down to zero and then Toby decides he's not going to write any more books. So this piracy thing, apparently they think of it as fair share. I ban it, I delete it all from my system. So um, a lot of the great permaculture people have stopped writing completely. Some have stopped making videos because it costs them $20,000 to put something out. And now with this level of piracy, it's not gonna, oh yeah, this is, this is a different thing. There's, amongst other instructors, there's this debate about um, whether or not you have to have the ethics. And, and basically with SEP stuff, then SEP uh, um, uh, teaches his stuff where it's like, here's a whole bunch of farming techniques and eco-living techniques and stuff like that. And so basically what I propose is that when you implement all of these things, you just so happen to have the ethics in it. They just kind of showed up. Whereas um, other people out in the permaculture world are saying that you have to start from the ethics. You have to fully and entirely comprehend the ethics and that when you follow those, eventually you will discover the farming techniques that come. All the eco techniques and farming techniques come from that. So we've ended up with, because um, uh, it was about 2004 that I was working and uh, as my day job as a software engineer, and I started, I tried to reach out to some of these people to say, 
I think the reason why permaculture is not a household word is because of this and because of things like this. And I think that it's really, really important that everybody knows about permaculture. And a lot of people, when they do this thing about how the ethics lead to the bricks, where the, if you understand the ethics, it leads to this other stuff, they believe that the ethics includes their personal religion and their personal political set. And so it's like, if you don't vote for the same people I vote for, you're not doing permaculture. If you don't go to the same church I go to, then that's not permaculture. And the, the system was riddled with that. And um, so I've, I've been pushing this, well anyway, it was in 2004, I tried to explain it to these people, they didn't buy it. I came to this odd conclusion that I had to do it. And so then I quit my job and I've been doing this ever since. Um, in order to get this to move forward. But I'm a firm believer in the, in the if you bring them the bricks, the ethics will follow. And, and I, I, I respect that not everyone will believe that. At the same time, I think it's okay to do this path, and I'm doing it. Next slide, please. The cult in permaculture. <laughs> this kind of leads to that whole thing about this re the religion or the politics. And so there's a lot of people that believe that you have to have this other philosophy set or whatever in order to do it. So, using the power vested in me by whatever it is, I hereby say that you can have the cult if you want or you can leave it behind if you want. You can just do the things and be an atheist if you want. I'm okay with that. I give you license to do permaculture without the cult. And I give you license to do permaculture and make a profit. Now, <laughs> this permission to have profit comes from, and I mentioned this earlier, the guy who's giving away more free stuff than all of the permaculture people combined. So I'm often um, um, reduced to, uh, or, or ridiculed uh, um, for being a money grubber. And that I'm giving away more than all of the permaculture people combined. So I'm saying it's okay to make a profit, in fact, I hope that someday all the food that you buy at Safeway is permaculture food because the farmers found that they made a bigger profit with permaculture than with Monsanto. Yeah. Next slide. Polyculture, this is one of the most important tools in the toolbox in my opinion. When you have a variety of plants all growing together, they feed each other. So uh, earlier today, um, at, the, at, the, at the P presentation, where's Charles? There he is, which was a great presentation. I, I kept thinking to myself, oh, rather than thinking about how much NPK from urine to put on all of these different things, which by the way, is a smart thing to do, I would much rather see a lot of polyculture. Because when you have polyculture, all of the plants, like for phosphorus, a lot of it was about peak phosphorus. There are plants that are awesome phosphorus accumulators and they share. They're very generous plants, especially when you have an old soil that's full of mycelium and there's a lot of exchange between the plants. The power of polyculture is immense. It's one of the most powerful tools in our toolbox. Next slide, please. Poop and pee as a resource. Hey, Charles, we're back on. <laughs> instead of a pollutant. So um, uh, in, in Charles' presentation, he, he mentioned Jenkins a few times, and later I talked to him about it. I, I'm not a big fan of Jenkins' work. Uh, this is the Humanure book. I'm not a big fan of that. I do think it blazed a broad trail, and it, and it really you know, put us forward, a big gob, but I think that there's some fine tuning that we need to do after that. So um, uh, Jenkins says that we shouldn't fear our poop. And I'm telling you here, no, fear your poop, fear it. <laughs> because there's pathogens in that and people can die from that. People can get really, really sick. So I don't like his techniques of like, look, I pooped in a bucket and now I'm gonna fuck with the bucket. <laughs> I don't like that. Or, or like, oh look, the bucket's full. Huh? <laughs> oh wait, till somebody else empties it. <laughs> No, I, 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 don't, I don't like that. That's a horrible system. I, there's all kinds of things I don't like about it. But the thing is, though, is that there, there's, 
We've got systems, we've got things that we can do that are um, far, far cleaner than anything Jenkins has thought of yet. And they, they are far cleaner for the environment than any septic tank or any waste management system in any city. Far, far better for the environment, far cleaner. And it's something that, that we can easily do. It's no big deal, it's a piece of cake. And I can convince you right now to do it all in about 30 seconds. Here's how it works. Your nose, how does your nose work? Your nose works because there's little shapes in your nose, the olfactory nerves, that pick up different kinds of scents because of the different kinds of particles that float in the air and stick to their inside, in the inside of your nose. So when Uncle Ralph goes in and punishes the toilet and the whole house can smell it, <laughs> All of Uncle Ralph's pathogens from his ass are now stuck inside your nose. <laughs> you can get sick from smelling somebody's shit. So, if you do the uh, current system, which you know you can smell, as opposed to something like the wheelie bin system where the air pressure inside of the chamber down below is lower than the air pressure inside of the bathroom, that means that you never smell anything. Therefore, your nose is safe. <laughs> I think that this is a powerful motivator. <laughs> Change the way you poop. Next slide, please. Ah. Oh, oh. Unraveling the greenwashing of the CFL. This is something where environmentalists keep saying that the CFL is a great thing and I try to express myself and after years of being told to shut the fuck up, I finally made a big article which just seemed to piss people off. So, and, and they got confused, so I had to make a video and, and the first video I made was called Mr. Stinky Pants. Who's seen my Mr. Stinky Pants video? Good. It, it explains the, the Phoebus cartel and it also explains why there's a strong motivator to CFLs that's a financial motivator for somebody else to get rich. Why the light bulb companies want you to use CFL and not incandescent. So, but people were still confused. They still didn't get it. And there was still all this backlash. And it's like, so I finally put together this video and where I conducted a variety of tests and I spelled it out a little bit more clearly. So basically, I put a bank of light bulbs together and um, trying to cut this short, the CFLs did not last nearly as long as was written on the package. I think the first one that burned out said that it would last 12,000 hours and it burned out in 72. <laughs> Then I go and I break down the thing about how uh, the EPA released a data sheet in 2008 that said something about how um, because of the pollution from coal-fired power plants that an incandescent light bulb actually puts more mercury pollution into the air than the amount of mercury pollution that would uh, come from a CFL. <laughs> and I break that down and I show how that was one great big fucking bag of lies. So the bottom line is the CFL is a toxic shit storm. It kills people during its manufacture. It makes people seriously ill during its normal operation. And it kills people after its disposal. This is our biggest environmental disaster ever. You wonder why it is you're not allowed to eat seafood more than twice a week, or is it now twice a month? It's because of the mercury. Primary source for it, the fucking CFL. However, it's got this lovely green packaging that says it's eco, and supposedly somewhere, big media keeps finding environmentalists to tell us how it's better for the environment. Horse shit, horse shit. So, I need you all to stop fucking feeding this monster. And I've got all the proof you need. And people, now I'm kind of getting sick of it. Every time there's a new study proving me right, I have to get like eight emails about it. And it's like, I can't put it all into the article. There's plenty of proof out there that this stuff is a toxic shitstorm. Oh, what about LEDs? Okay, LEDs are not as bad, but they're still not as good as incandescent. A nice, simple, clean bulb. Just, you know what, you know what's way better than any of this? Turn off the fucking lights.
I think, I think, um, you know that art, that bit we had earlier about the, um, the how I cut 87% off of my electric heat bill? Here's a weird thing. The, the incandescent light bulbs, they also give off heat. So I don't know about down here in San Diego, but up in Montana, it tends to get dark at night at about the same time it gets cold. So it's like, wow, how convenient. We get heat and light from the same thing. That's stacking functions, isn't it? This incandescent bulb, this old school incandescent bulb, which was intentionally manufactured to have a very short lifespan, is amazing. Next slide, please. Oh, I want the people who call themselves environmentalists to be against the poisons, the sickness, lies, and wickedness behind the CFLs. Next slide, please. Here's a bunch of pallets that this woman over uh, in the Seattle area cobbled together to make an amazing fence. How many people here have ever kept hogs? Am I the only person? One person, two people, three people, four people. Okay. Man, hogs can be hard on a fence. Goats. Who here has kept goats? Man, those are, those, I mean, it's like, it's like their primary mission in life is to defeat any fence. <laughs> this fence has held in both goats and pigs. And it's not even attached to the ground. It's just attached, they're just attached to each other. And they're, it's all free materials. She even got the screws that holds it together for free. And it's, it's amazingly strong. Uh, so that's all, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so here I've got a video that's just a funny little thing. Um, I've just got this jumping spider that came down onto my screen and started crawling around on it. And then I started moving the mouse around and he started chasing the mouse and, <laughs> and he tried to, he bit it like three or four times. Um, but here's, here's the thing is that uh, when I was a younger man, I would just, I just didn't like spiders in the house. So I got rid of all the spiders. And then I got bit by a brown recluse. I had an enormous welt on my arm for six months. Um, and, and if you've ever had that, that's dead tissue. It, could, it can kill you. So, um, but here's the thing, is that if you keep around the jumping spiders and the daddy long legs, they don't harm you. And they don't hurt you in any way. And they eat up all the spider food. That was another thing too. When I got rid of all the spiders, I seem to have a shit ton of flies in the house. <laughs> There's bugs everywhere. What the hell? And I'm trying to kill them too. So, but if I keep, if I go ahead and let the jumping spiders and the daddy long legs hang out, I don't have any bugs or flies or anything like that. And I don't have any brown recluse spiders. Next slide, please. A tea lud. Let's see if I can say this correctly. Top lit updraft stove. So basically, it, it pulls off the wood gases from the wood and burns that, leaving behind charcoal. The good thing is, is that it burns very cleanly during the burn, and then afterwards you have charcoal, which you might be able to use for a few things. I'm not a fan of biochar. I think a lot of you know that. Um, but, and, and this is why they do it, is for the biochar. If nothing else though, this is a fascinating technology. It's a good thing to have this little bit of information in your head on how it works, why it works, and why would you care. So um, I've got a video about it. I think it's a fun little video. Next slide, please. <laughs> Recognize this? <laughs> got this picture in just in the nick of time. Sealing a pond without a liner, um, and so, a lot of people are going to go build a pond, and there's a lot of good reasons to build a pond, and then they, they use EPDM or cement to seal it. And in this case, this was easy to seal. But at the same time, um, where's Alden? Al Alden? Alden, there he is. Alden, I'm going to pick on you. So over at Alden's house, he's got this little tiny pond, but it's got like a rubber liner in it. And it's actually your mom's house, isn't it? At Lolly's house? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like, because he didn't know. It's what we all turn to. It's our, all of our default thing. So this is yet another tidbit of information I want to share with you. A lot of times, we don't, you don't need to do anything. Just shape it like a pond and the water will stay in there. In this particular case, the clay where we were digging this was of a high, or the, the soil, the dirt that we were using to, to fool with was of a high enough clay content. We didn't really need to do anything. It's gonna hold the water. It's possible it might leak, but if it does, it'll be very easy to seal. So um, we've got all kinds of techniques, we've got all kinds of threads, we've got an entire forum at permies.com dedicated to ponds and how to seal them without a liner. 
And um, if you ever want to see what it looks like to see um, a German man swearing for half an hour, then ask Sepp Holzer about what kind of liner to use to build your pond. <laughs> so I saw him do that once and it was pretty amazing and the translators refused to translate most of it. <laughs> and then the only thing that they did translate is, I give your question an F. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Similar thing to the t -Lud. this guy is powering his truck on wood gas. So basically, you just take a chunk of wood, you warm it up, it gives off gas, like, like a gas that floats in the air gas, like propane kind of a thing, which you can then run your truck off of. Next slide. Um, one of the problems that we have with the electric cars is that those batteries need to be replaced. And that, you know, there's some problems with range and stuff like that. But then the whole compressed air vehicles technology, we have a bunch of stuff, a bunch of threads out of Permis on this. Basically, the battery is nothing more than a tank. That's it, just an air tank. Everything involved in the system runs very cool. Nothing is burned. There's no carbon dioxide or anything like that given off. And there's no toxic chemicals being used for the battery. It's just an air tank. It's just, you just pressurize the tank and then it propels your vehicle for hundreds of miles. Next slide, please. Pooless. Going pooless. Sounds like you'll gain a lot of weight, doesn't it? <laughs> so who here is currently pooless? Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Maybe, Some, sometimes, I didn't know you could do sometimes. You're either all the way in or you're all the way out. In fact, I just got an email just like uh, three days ago, I think it was, from somebody who said that they um, heard one of my podcasts uh, last winter or last uh, like November, December, and so they went poolless in December. For 20 years, they had uh, migraines that would cause blackouts and puking. And uh, sometimes as often as three times a week. And, and, he, and this person emailed me to say that they haven't had a migraine since December when they went poolless. So now I get a lot of emails from a lot of people saying a lot of stuff like this. So like with the CFLs, I've had tons of people write to me to say, we got rid of the CFLs and my lifetime of headaches went away. We got rid of the CFLs and that rash on my skin went away. And um, you know, I got rid of the CFLs and I'm able to do things again, whereas before I was depressed and unmotivated. But, but this was the first one I've gotten about being poolless. So the idea is that in your shower, you don't use any shampoo or soap. And um, you would think that you would go from smelly hippie to smellier hippie. Um, but, but actually, um, so far, the results seem to be in that when you go poolless, you actually smell better. I've stopped using deodorant. I haven't used any deodorant. I've been poolless for nearly two years. I stopped using deodorant and um, I, the report is, is that I smell, I stink less than when I was using deodorant. So um, basically, you, you, found a, you found an interpretation Still for that. Stink. Still stink. <laughs> I don't think so. You want to come up here and check the pits? Oh. You good? <laughs> I mean, wasn't it yesterday we had like pictures with 20 different people who all got into my armpit? I, we took their pictures. I was there. You were there? How'd it smell? Yeah, I didn't smell anything. And I was hiking up and down those hills and stuff like that. <laughs> this ought to be a commercial. <laughs> so I actually, um, this is, is going to sound really weird, but of all the things that I've advocated and all the things that I've tried, I, I really like this one as one of, this is like the top five list. I mean, now I go and I used to take a shower, it was three minutes, and all the reasons to like reduce the amount of time in the shower is important. Um, you know, like don't use, let, use less energy for the hot water and, and uh, don't stress the septic system or the sewage system as much. Um, you know, things like that, just use less water, it's always good to use less water. All these different things, but um, now I've, gone, I've cut my shower time from three minutes to one minute. I mean, after a minute, it's like, I got nothing left to do in here. <laughs> It's like, it's, uh, I don't have to rinse anything out. I already kind of did all of that. Um, uh, so then uh, a lot of people have been reporting that their hair grows thicker and longer and healthier. Uh, a lot of people have been reporting that the conditions of their skin vastly improve. Jocelyn and I recently put out a podcast where she talked about how she's been futzing with her hair and her skin for a long, long time, and now she tried it. Uh, 
more than a year after I tried it uh, because he saw all the good results with me. So now she tried it and, and she's just had amazingly awesome results. So, um, but we've got big, big threads out of Permis talking about this, going poolless. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a quickie, the last coffee maker. So I've burned through a bunch of different ways of making coffee and I need, I, I, I uh, yet another French press broke again. And, and so um, uh, I, I did this as a short term thing and um, it works so good, I'm doing this forever now. Basically, I already had the glass Pyrex thing and, um, and then I, I had one of these strainers and all I do is I put the coffee in the strainer and um, pour the hot water through it. That's, that's it. <laughs> and it's like, where's all the money to be spent? Where's all the contraptionery? And there's all this, no, this is it. This, this, is, uh, this stainless steel thing should last me forever. It's a piece of cake. So all I, all, it's a tiny little thing. Just consuming less, trying to consume less. Next slide, please. <laughs> this is Adrian drawing, trying to draw my no more compost piles. So we all know the value of compost. Compost is indeed an amazing thing. However, you might not be aware of the full price tag of it. So you start off with a compost pile that's this big and then it composts and you end up with something that's this big. All that extra stuff turned into nitrogen and carbon in the atmosphere and now wait a minute, okay, so our atmosphere is already made of 80% nitrogen, but then that carbon that goes in the atmosphere goes up as like what, carbon dioxide? Oh, what's the thing that we don't want in our atmosphere? Carbon dioxide, it's causing global warming. So if you're composting, congratulations, you're fucking up the planet. <laughs> so now granted, the final resulting compost does have some magical properties for gardening and whatnot, but all that carbon and nitrogen is, this, is the exact stuff that we want in our gardens. We don't want it going up into the air. So we find ways to work it into our systems without composting it. In fact, on my farm, I couldn't make a compost pile. So I, because I don't like the smell, I, I did the paddock shift systems with all my animals. They all had a portable shelter. So I never cleaned out a chicken coop. I never cleaned out a pig stall or, or a, an animal stall of any kind because I would move the shelters. There was never an accumulation of manure anywhere. I kept moving the shelters. And then for all the kitchen scraps, those all went to the chickens or the pigs. There was nothing to compost with. Now Ruth Stout, the amazing Ruth Stout. Who here is familiar with Ruth Stout? Oh yes, the goddess. <laughs> the goddess of mulch. So her thing was is that you go lift up some mulch and you pitch your kitchen scraps under it and put the mulch back down. That way when it decomposes, it doesn't go up in the atmosphere, it gets trapped in the mulch. It's still part of the soil. So much, much better results. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're back onto a segue. Um, somebody made this meme. This is something that I said, I think on the Farmageddon podcast, we reviewed the Farmageddon movie and I said this and it ended up in a meme. When you take away the ChemAg subsidies and the organic ag penalties, ChemAg food will cost the consumer nearly four times more. Anybody want to contest that? All right. In the past, when the, when, they, when the meme went up on Facebook and it just went apeshit all over the place, I think 250,000 people saw it. Um, or I think it was shared 250,000 times. Maybe that was it. Um, then I had, I, there was a bunch of people who came and said, that's bullshit, prove it. And it's like, oh, this is always gobs of fun rather than help me understand. The, then the response is, is like, I'm gonna call it a lie until you prove it. Uh, this seems to be the mentality that we have that I find very frustrating. But let's just consider for a moment um, some of the subsidies programs. For corn, just the subsidy that's paid to farmers is 75 to 80% just for corn, just for what's paid to the farmers. That doesn't include the subsidies that's paid to something like ConAgra or the subsidies for the, because they're going to use petroleum-based fertilizers, the subsidies that are paid for that. I mean, there's subsidies all along the ways, but just for the subsidies that's paid just to the farmers, 75 to 80%. Already it's gone up by nearly a factor of four. Then you look at the organic ag stuff. 
If you want to be a chem ag person, there's nothing to it. You don't have to file hardly any paperwork at all. But for organic ag, you have to fill out this much paperwork every month. And then you get to part with some of your money to get to use the organic label. So there's an organic ag penalty. Now personally, I think we should invert the organic laws. I think that any product that you find on the shelves that's not organic should be labeled as to why. <laughs> and then anything, everything else, the organic, there should be no organic label, that's just stupid. <laughs> so then I think that you need to have the chem ag folk document, you know, all, how much toxic gick are you putting? We, you know, you've already confessed that you're hosing our food down with toxic gick. I think we need to start filling out some paperwork on how much toxic gick you're using. Yeah. Next slide. <laughs> here's a quick one. So we saw a stack of rocks being used as sled control. But here's a, here's a fun thing. If you take a stack of rocks, the rocks in the middle will stay cool just because there's not sun hitting them. And then also, you know, the soil beneath it is also cooler. And then when warm, moist air passes through that pile of rocks, the rock in the middle gets to have condensation on it and water dribbles off of it and feeds like a fruit tree or something like that. Just a quickie. Next one. A natural swimming pool. So the DVD by David Pagan Butler is quite good. We have um, uh, like three or four hours of podcast review of that where um, it's me and Anna Burkus, who is an expert in this space, um, talk about every single detail that we see in the video, what we agree with, what we don't agree with, what we want to offer alternatives for. And then later on, Maddie Harland of Permanent Publications, who put out the, the, the video, told me that David Bacon Butler was scared of me. <laughs> So, um, but we had him on to Permies and we gave away a bunch of his DVDs. By the way, every week we give away usually four books or four DVDs or four tickets to something uh, every week. And so it's like, and then you get to visit with the authors. So we'll, um, we'll have the authors come down to Permies and answer questions and, and then we'll give away the books. Next slide, please. Oh, by the way, previous slide, go back. So the natural swimming pool, basically the idea is that you've got your uh, swimming pool shape, but you'll have a bunch of plants growing around it, and you'll just keep the water moving through the plants and through the gravel to filter the pool instead of using any chlorine. No chlorine at all, very clear. You can kind of see how clear these look just by looking at these pictures. Very clear, very clean water. So um, uh, no, no, I mean, no chlorine, and you can even do it without using any of the liners that they're using here, it's possible. Okay, next slide. Catching a mouse without a mouse trap. Another quick and simple thing. Um, this is actually can be scaled up for rats, but, um, uh, and, and then as you can see, it's a live trap. It's just a five gallon bucket and a piece of two by four. Oh, and, and a bit of peanut butter. Because they love the peanut butter. So um, basically this was at a place I was staying at and I saw a mouse and they didn't have any mouse traps. So I just grabbed a bucket and a two by four and put the peanut butter in there and it was 20 minutes later it caught the first mouse and then I went to bed and in the morning there were two mice in there. <laughs> Next slide please. Fleas! So um, <laughs> I had to write this article because I lived in a community house at some point in time and um, all the house moved out because there were fleas. And it's like, um, and they, they all gave their 30 days notice to move out while I was away for a week visiting family and they discovered the fleas. Um, and it's like, I tried to talk to them over the phone like, no, don't panic, don't, it's, it's no big deal. And then they were all sure, all of them, all of them were utterly convinced that they were going to die of the plague. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. And so I had to look all this up and it's like, yes, there is still plague and it's in New Mexico and, in, and you've got to like travel 20 miles away from the nearest house. And um, uh, so you'd have to be a researcher studying these rodents that still have plague in order to get the plague. So I told them that the odds of them getting plague from the fleas in this house uh, that the, the odds were smaller than being elected president and being struck by lightning on your inauguration day. <laughs> 
But that didn't matter, that, you know, they, they all went. Um, so I ended up writing this article because I kept doing all this research and coming back to them and saying, you know, don't panic, don't panic. So this artist made this lovely rendition of Fleezilla with the woman screaming, uh, which I think is so, so appropriate. But uh, in fact, I think somebody at this event told me that they found out about my permaculture empire by finding my flea control article. In fact, right now, oh, thanks. <laughs> Has anybody else read my flea control article? Only a few. So um, I think right now, if you Google flea control, I think I'm number one. <laughs> so I'm, I'm convincing people to not use, because these guys, while I was gone, they hired flea busters who put poison all throughout the house. And flea busters, you know, has all this advertising. It's natural. Yes, it's naturally toxic. <laughs> so um, it's gonna be uh, borates and pyrethrins, which are naturally occurring and toxic. Granted, mildly toxic, but still toxic. Diet, I mean, so I, in the article I go and I advocate a lot of diatomaceous earth, and I advocate a few other things that you can do. But um, uh, it's easy to beat the fleas, uh, you just gotta be persistent, and, uh, but it's all natural and costs practically nothing. Also, for bed bugs, nothing beats diatomaceous earth. Next slide, please. Oh, part of it is to understand the, the life cycle of the flea. Just wrap your head around how it works so you know what to expect. So these guys <coughs> had flea busters come in, spray all their crap, and we still had fleas. And part of it had to do with the life cycle, part of it had to do with the fact that, their, that the product that they used wasn't as effective as diatomaceous earth. Next slide. Oh. <laughs> Bee hut. So there, there's a picture of my son at the age of 14. Um, you can't see it in the picture, but at 14, he was developing his fangs. Ah, I'm a teenager, I hate you! <laughs> it's a natural cycle of life. <laughs> so this is a bee hut. This is something that he and I created together. It was a bonding moment. <laughs> the thing is, is that if you put your beehives in something like this, then you don't need to use paint on the hives, they will stay dry. And on top of that, honey production, which is an, uh, a way of measuring overall hive health, goes up by a factor of four. So um, the, the bees are far, far healthier and happier by putting them in a shelter, which is also keeping the hives up off of the ground and keeping them dry. This is just like one of the most important things for bee health. And this isn't even one of the 12 things that's listed in the colony collapse disorder video that I made. Next slide, please. Raising cattle without hay. And of course, this can apply to any ruminant. I mean, when you, when you keep your own hay, that's a lot of expensive equipment when you kind of bale your own hay and all of that. Then, if you're going to buy hay, that's pretty expensive every year. That's a lot of work. Baling hay, a lot of work. I'm lazy, not compatible. I've baled a lot of hay. And um, I don't like it. I don't want to do it anymore. And so then we've got a podcast that goes over all the techniques of raising uh, cattle without hay. So it can be done. There's a lot to it. It's just a little bit of knowledge. And, and then um, on your own land, you can raise all your ruminants without having to ever buy any hay at all. Next slide, please. Never buy chicken feed again. What to plant. So I've got a, um, an art, I've put together a blog. Make It Missoula just loves it when I write a blog for them because then they'll get like 90% of the traffic that the entire site ever gets whenever I write a blog for them. Um, so I think that's one of the ones I wrote for them was uh, what, what chicken feed to plant. But um, ever since I wrote my chicken, raising chickens article, um, I've gotten tons and tons of feedback and we've gotten lots and lots of people out at Permies talking about all the different things to plant and which different climates to be able to optimize uh, the chicken feed bill. And by optimize, I mean get it down to zero. So when I was raising chickens and selling eggs and selling meat, I was selling the eggs and meat for about the same cost of what I was paying for feed. Not sustainable. So then I started to explore the idea of like, well, I'm gonna grow my own feed and I'll feed that to them. And yet that was violating my rules of being a lazy bastard. So then I thought, well, what if I make the chickens harvest it? That was a golden idea. And that's worked out awesome. This is also what Sepp Holzer does. Although um, 
I, we, I asked him about like, you know, so, so in your systems, are they able to eat all the food, you know, that you've put out there, like even through the winter all year long? And Sepp says, absolutely. And then I go and I ask his son, Yosef, and he says, oh no, we always put a little bit aside because there's 12 days of the year, everything is like frozen rock solid, and we take pity on the chickens and throw some food out for them. So um, anyway, but you can eliminate your feed bill. And the other thing is, is Joel Salatin has this talk that he does at, at Google. By the way, I'll be speaking with Joel Salatin in Idaho at the end of June. I get Friday and he gets Saturday, and we're going to kind of have an animal raising off thing between he and I. <laughs> but uh, I love Joel Salatin's comment. Every restaurant should have a bunch of chickens out back. Then you take all those scraps from everybody's plates and you throw them out to the chickens and then you pull eggs and chicken out of that system to feed to your customers. Next slide, please. Ah, here we go. Here we go. This is the wheat and eco scale item I always like to refer to. Sepp Holzer says, put lots of poisonous plants out for your animals. So remember the part where we talked about um, some people, when somebody is way ahead of you, you might think that they're crazy. And of course, remember, SEP is at eco level 10. <laughs> Therefore, damn near everybody is going to think that he's crazy. Now, who here has seen the SEP Holzer videos? Okay, more of you need to see them. But um, those videos are dumbed down. I and mean, there's a lot of stuff that's done in those videos just for the sake of the video. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that he does that didn't go into the video because it seemed too crazy. So, uh, put lots of poisonous plants out for your animals. A lot of people would completely freak out of that. Now, I think permaculture people, once, once I say, this is what Sepp Holzer does, then I think most of you have complete faith in Sepp. Like anything that Sepp says, and it sounds crazy, you know you're wrong. If, I mean, is that not true? I mean, that's how I feel. If Seb says something that sounds utterly crazy to me, I just know that I must be wrong and I have something to learn here. That's, that's the attitude I take. But the key is, is that you'll plant lots of poisonous plants, but you'll also have lots of other plants. And then when an animal comes into that system, they're gonna only eat the things because their instinct is so strong. They're gonna, eat the, they're gonna only eat the things that is good for them to eat. And then on some days, they'll be feeling a little poorly. Ooh. And so what they do is, is that suddenly this one plant, which was damn nasty yesterday, today smells like something I want to eat a little bit of. They self-medicate. That toxic plant will kill them in large quantities, but in small quantities, it's a medicine. Just like for any prescription that you might possibly get, if you eat the whole bottle, you will die. But if you eat just a little bit, it's theoretically going to help you. <laughs> Same kind of thing. Only the instinct for animals is far stronger. I mean, we have instincts too, just not as strong. Now, if I go and I have this piece of festering roadkill and I hold it up to your face, do you say, mmm, yum, put that in my pie hole? <laughs> no. No. Instinct says, Bleh! All right, so our, we have a little bit of instinct. It's just not as strong. Now, if I, if I have huckleberry pie that's steaming and fresh out of the oven, yes, pie, pie hole, pie, pie hole. <laughs> a match made in heaven. <laughs> yeah, ooh, almost done. Here comes the pie. All right, next slide, please. No more transplanting, stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> how many people, so this is a question that I ask usually when I'm giving my talk on uh, how to replace irrigation with permaculture, but how many of you have had tomato volunteer plants that you've let go and the tomatoes have outperformed, the volunteers have outperformed the transplants? I want the rest of you to look at all those hands going up and see that it can be done. And so now the next time you see a volunteer tomato plant go up, maybe you should just rip out your, your transplants. Oh, well, <laughs> my transplants aren't gonna do as good. Let the volunteer go. Most people are plucking out all the volunteers. Stop that, stop it. So the key is, is every time you transplant, every time it stresses the plant, it's just that some plants can tolerate it better than others. But did nature design this whole system 
for transplanting or did nature design it to go from seeds? Sometimes through rhizomes, but you know, uh, sometimes if it's a willow tree, it's from <laughs> the stick blew off and landed there and eight trees grew up. <laughs> um, but definitely not through, not through the transplanting system that we use today. Stop transplanting. Sepp Holzer never, well I shouldn't say never transplants, he rarely transplants, rarely. He avoids transplanting as much as possible. So start everything from seed. And if you want, if you want to, if you want to like run things a little faster, if you want to like have something on the, on the, on the last day of frost, I don't know when that, well of course for some of you it's like frost, what's frost? <laughs> Most of you speak of. I, re I have to remember where I am. Frost? So I, I've heard that there is frost here sometimes. Okay. So uh, it gets to be the last. You want to have a little tomato plant growing there? Hey, here's an idea. Cloche. Cloche. Then put the cloche out there. Just It could be plastic or preferably glass. You know, put it out there. Uh, and where you're going to put the tomato plant, like um, uh, six weeks early six weeks before your uh, first frost date. And then just have it sit out there for a couple of weeks. That's gonna warm the soil right there. And then take a seed and whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. All right? <laughs> then, and then when there's little cotyledons sticking up, they're the first little leaves that come up, then you can like remove the little cap on the top or, or a little bit of air in there, have there be a little of air exchange. Then when you get to the first frost date is passed, then just take the cloche off. You never had to harden it off. You never had to um, do all those crazy things with lights and watering and plastic trays made out of petroleum products and all that kind of crap. So easy. Next slide, please. See the big X? <laughs> X, brought to you by Adrian. Do you have um, a talk or a video or something that goes more into detail about that? Um, mostly I just say it louder. <laughs> But, but we, everything. I mean, when you, when you plant a perennial, there's usually other things to it. But the, but the thing is that permies.com, I mean, we, we talk about this kind of thing all the time. All the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> you guys got to get better at that. <laughs> that almost worked. <laughs> Out at permies.com, we talk about that all the time. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> all right. Greenhouses are an artificial thing. I don't know about you, but I'm not big on the artificial thing. So all the light that comes in comes through glass or plastic or something like that. And then on top of that, um, there's all kinds of challenges. Now you're not part of the ecosystem. You have separated yourself from the ecosystem. So things can go crazy. Now, Zach Weiss is somebody who's done greenhouses and I really trust a lot of the stuff he has to say about greenhouses. But at the same time, I much prefer the idea of dodging the greenhouse entirely. There are ways. Keep in mind, Sepp Holzer, the mighty, the glorious, the amazing Sepp Holzer, <laughs> he grows citrus trees outdoors in the Alps of Austria where it gets to be 20 below. Now granted, around here, citrus trees are like no big deal. But there, it's a big deal, trust me, come on. <laughs> buy in. So basically the thing is is that he has food all year long in a place that's riddled with ice and snow and he doesn't use a greenhouse for any of that food. Next slide please. Oh wait, I should say Tefa. Tefa, textured earth food all year. It's another word I made up. I mean one of the things is being demonstrated in this image is the idea of you've got this wall back here and you've got the sun hitting the wall twice. So you've got twice as much sunlight. So now this wall is going to absorb all of this extra heat. And in this particular drawing, this is a crappy drawing that I put up on Permies. We talk about this stuff all the time. And, and so this is basically some of the Wafati design stuff for thermal inertia. So then this is going to be putting out heat all throughout the winter time. And, and so here you've got just a little bit of a pond or a pool and it's reflecting water and then this is throwing off. So anyway, basically textured earth, if, 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 it's, if it's flat, everything is equally cold or equally hot all the time. If it's lumpy, 
and the sun's over here, this spot's gonna be warm and this spot's gonna be cold, all right? So here's your Hugel culture bed, warm and cold. So you're gonna be adding warm spots and cold spots all over your land. Granted, in a greenhouse, you can do the greenhouse thing in such a small piece of land. True, absolutely true. But hey, let's look at some bigger chunks of land. If you've got a bigger chunk of land, then we can use that to our advantage to have hot spots and cold spots. Next slide. Converting a dry gully to a creek. This is a big part of what we do in permaculture. You've got something that's really, really dry, and we can bring a creek back. Who's seen that lovely little movie called The Man Who Planted Trees? Was that awesome and magnificent? Is it, I mean, for me, it's like my top five movies of all time. It's just, it's just that good. And of course, a big part of it is, is that the guy's walking through this desert and there's no water anywhere, plant some trees, and suddenly the creeks start to come back. That's a huge part of permaculture. Next slide, please. Stealth pond. <laughs> you know, some places it's not legal to have a pond. Weird as that may sound, but what if, what if you made a pond, filled it with enormous rocks, then on top of that you put smaller rocks, and then smaller rocks, and then gravel, and then sand, and then dirt on top of all of that. There would be a pond there, only no one would know. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually something that's being done a lot in Africa, mostly to keep all the critters out of the, of the water. They need the drinking water. So then what they'll do is they effectively put a spigot in that, and now they've got this enormous reservoir of water and it's perfectly clean. But at the same time, in the United States, sometimes the, um, the Department of Making You Sad works harder <laughs> than other places. And, and it's like, you know, you just are not allowed to have a pond, but you want to have all the benefits that come with a pond, or at least some of the benefits that come with a pond. And so you can do stealth pond. Next slide, please. All right, so this one will be more fun. Little segue, husk. Another word I made up. So um, first of all, I want to point out that Mr. Rogers gave me license to make things up. <laughs> all right, when I was a little kid, he told me about the land of make-believe and, and he, he encouraged me to pretend. So I'm gonna pretend right before your very eyes. Ready, here it goes. I'm gonna say that 403 years ago, when John Smith met Pocahontas, things went down different. Turns out Pocahontas is an awesome warrior babe. She filled his ass with arrows because he didn't respect her. <laughs> he went packing. Then she turned around and she told everybody and she sent messengers that these white people are jerks. They're assholes. Anytime you see them, fill their ass with arrows. Every time. Don't ask questions. So. In the thing, in my imagination, which Mr. Rogers might not approve of this particular train of thought. <laughs> but I'm going to use this license however I want. I decided that we ended up with a place that just so happens to have the exact same borderline as the United States of America, but it's called the United States of Pocahontas. And I'm going to say, just for giggles, in my fiction that I made up, that when they came up with the idea of the plow, the people of the USP said, no, that would be like raping mother nature. We're not, we're not into that. And then later when they came up with pesticides, they're like, oh yeah, no way, no way, we're not, we're not doing that. Because here's the thing to keep in mind, 403 years ago, the agriculture that was practiced on this land was very, very similar to permaculture. Or more accurately, permaculture is very similar to that. So, now I'm really curious. 403 years later, keep in mind that um, when John Smith met Pocahontas, the population of this land is almost the same as it is now. Then, shortly after John Smith came, they also brought over those blankets that happened to have the smallpox. So let's say the smallpox still came, wiped out 95% of the population, but it grew back, and so let's say the population is kind of like what it is now but things are just a little different. 
and, and now every time I try on Permies, I try to express my ideas in this space, then it's like 87 different people have to come out and talk about wars and these people hate those people and whatever else. But forget that. This is my imagination. This is my pretend story. I get to make it out, say whatever I want. So I pretend further that this land becomes a mecca for health for the rest of the world. People will come here riddled with some obnoxious disease and while they're here, it just mysteriously goes away for whatever reason. Who knows the reason? Maybe in their land, they like GMOs. Maybe they like pesticides. Maybe they like fucking with the dirt. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Here, their illness simply goes away. So this is, this is my imaginary thing. Now, there's, there's a second part to this and a third part. The second part goes like this. Wow, I'm so curious like what this would be like after 403 years of evolving these systems and then they hear about things that are being done in agriculture in other countries and some of those ideas they say, ooh, shiny, I like that one. And so then they adopt the ones that they like, the ones that they feel are good. And so um, what would it be like now? What would be some of the things that they would do? Surely they would use hugel culture. Um, so I don't know. So I had this idea. I documented it thoroughly out at Permi several years ago. I actually presented it to the tribe up there, and that was weird. But <laughs> the key is, like, what if we had 2,000 acres and we had 20 different artisans in seed and soil? And then um, some of them would have 20 acres and some of them would have 200 acres. And, and then basically they would each sit down on, on their little plot and then they would do what they believed was awesome. Some of them would be into biodynamics, some permaculture. Some would like only native plants and some would be you know, crazy about something that we haven't come up with a name for yet or whatever. And so then um, 20 different artisans and once a year they're all put on a bus and taken around to see all the rest. Now naturally, they're artisans. So each artisan looks to the other 19 artisans and say, those guys are stupid. <laughs> I'm the most awesome. <laughs> but on the other hand, guy number 12 had a cool thing going on and I'm gonna steal that idea and work it into my stuff now. And guy number five, while being a fool, he did do an interesting thing with water. And I'm gonna steal some of that. So my idea was, is that all of these systems would then be propelled forward like they all had jet packs on them. And thus, maybe after merely 100 years, we would complete 400 years of growth. It's just an idea. So. The last thing is, is that I'm currently looking for land and um, I came up with this idea that my land would be divided into four pieces. The first piece would be called organic. The second piece would be called uh, permaculture. The third piece would be called simbaculture, another word I made up. And the fourth piece would be called husp. And on each piece of land, it would be better based upon my standards. So then by the time you got to simbaculture, very little paint is allowed, virtually zero paint is allowed. Um, and uh, petroleum, uh, uh, petroleum based vehicles don't go past organic. Uh, and each level is 10 times better than the previous le level. So let's see, you could still use an electric vehicle on permaculture and simbiculture, but no vehicles at all are allowed onto husk land. And by better on husk land, it's not like you're going back in time. No, it's just better based on my standards, which is totally different. So, no plastic is allowed at all on husk land. No electricity, no plumbing is allowed. No fire is allowed. So, basically, this is a collection of challenges. And I think husk is trying to imagine things which we don't have now. There's so much farther we can go. And we don't even have a lot of the reasons why. We haven't even figured a lot of that out yet. So, Husp, to me, I mean, this is a big thing. We have so many people on Permis talking about husp. What might husp be? What might husp be for all three scenarios? Whether it's just my piece of land, or whether it's something that we might be able to recreate, or whether it's something that's merely happening inside of my head. <laughs> a lot of people debate about what happens in my head. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, so I've got a few slides just about some plants. So, who here has eaten nettles in the last week? Who here has eaten nettles at least three times in the last week? Who here has eaten nettles nearly every day this week? 
Oh, drink is okay. Consume, drink, okay. And, and then, of course, we've got Alden and Anne in the back, still holding her, because they've been, all we've been here, they bring us little bags of nettles every day. So um, uh, we've been eating, in fact, just before coming down here, we ate nettles in our eggs um, and had a bunch of nettles, and we've been eating nettles here quite a bit, too. But this is a super food, and, it's, and then people are like, oh, it's, I, I was at a presentation up in L.A., and the, and the presenter, who was uh, actually really good, and, and this guy was really good, too, but I didn't get a chance to say it. Um, uh, but then uh, we, he was saying something about, like, oh, it's hard to grow this stuff. It's hard to have these systems come into play and everything. And, and, I, was, and I went and I picked a bit, a bit of nettles and put it up on the chair for him. But it's like, we have things that are growing here like crazy. It's food everywhere. I mean, walking around this property, there's nettles everywhere. And this is, this is a food. There is no other plant that I'm aware of that has more protein in it than nettles. And, and so on top of that, it's like it's got all these superfood things and it tastes good. I don't particularly like greens, but I really like nettles. And on top of that, if you just lightly steam them, they're fuzzy. It's a fuzzy food. How? I don't know if any other food is a fuzzy food. You put it in your mouth and it's like, that is the weirdest thing. <laughs> Another thing is, is that if you have this powerful craving for hamburger, like, oh, I just really need to eat a great big old hamburger, I'm just eating that, and you eat nettles, it somehow fills that void, whereas if you ate chicken, it wouldn't. It's so weird. Nettles are so awesome. I, I mean, I've got seven videos up about nettles. I bet I could put ten more up. Nettles are an amazing super, super plant. Um, and then, oh, here's another great one. Anytime now we get people come on to permies.com and it's like they want to talk about hemp. And it's kind of like, I mean, oh, it says you, you know, make rope out of it. How, how much rope do you need? <laughs> the thing is, is that I say, okay, tell you what, you can talk about hemp. You can talk about the permaculture approach to growing hemp after you've had at least that much discussion about nettles, because for almost everything for which hemp is good at, with the exception of getting stoned, <laughs> nettles are better. Nettles makes better rope. Nettles makes better clothes. Nettles almost better at everything than hemp with the exception of the, the getting stone thing. And it's so political. I just don't need to have the political bullshit on the website. So it's like, uh, and then it's like, oh, but it's legal. Okay, go out, do, grow your legal hemp, and then from prison you can tell me about how it's still, <laughs> how it's legal. But officer, it's legal. Shut the fuck up and get in the car. Yeah, the feds don't seem to think it's legal yet. It's kind of awkward. <laughs> Next slide, please. Sunchokes. This, this provides more calories per acre than any other food that I'm currently aware of. This is referred to as the survival food. It's perennial. You plant it, and then you can go back into the ground. In Montana, you might have heard, it gets cold there. And when it gets cold, the, the ground kind of turns into this cement, but we call it ice. I don't know if you, oh wait, you guys have heard it. You put it in your drinks here. <laughs> we get it all, we get it for free all over the ground. So then you go out there to the shovel and it's ping, ping. Well, eventually it'll warm up a little bit and you can dig nettles out, or I mean, sorry, <laughs> dig sunchokes out all year long. All year sunchokes, whatever you want. Whenever you want food, it's just sitting out in the ground waiting for you. All winter, all spring, all summer, all the sun chokes you want. And there's gobs of it. It just reproduces and reproduces and reproduces. One of the best things for pigs, they'll root it out and eat it themselves. Chickens will scratch at it and then peck at it forever and eat it. It's a superfood. Some people refer to it as fartichokes. <laughs> you might try cooking them. So we got tons of discussion about all of that out at permies.com. <laughs> Next slide. Mullen. This is one of the things I turn to when people start talking about native plants. Because mullen is not a native plant, yet the native people didn't give a shit. They called it white man's footprints. They found 17 different uses for this amazing plant. I've got this video on it where I've got 12 different people who contributed to the video. In the video, I think it's my favorite plant video. And, um, and of course they refer to it as cowboy toilet paper. Uh, uh, but the big thing is, is that wherever it grows, it grows on the worst possible soils. It'll grow on gravel. It'll grow on asphalt. 
So whenever you're thinking to yourself about how this parking lot shouldn't be here, <laughs> maybe you want to get some mullein and shake the, the seeds out on it. It'll grow in asphalt. It'll grow in rock. Just Here's a great big slab of rock. And yet mullein's going to break that rock. It's going to find a way. And then as soon as any other plant can grow there, mullein politely bows out. And so then basically it just goes around the world healing all of your fuck-ups. <laughs> what an amazing plant. So we've got a, I've got a, a whole YouTube video on, on mullein. I'm so proud of this video. It's just great. So it's not an edible, but definitely it has a whole bunch of medicinal properties to it. But it's just a great healing the earth plant. Um, and I made the video with the idea that it's fun and then people watch it. And I never say stop spraying this. But I've been told that there's a lot of people that watched it just for fun or somebody directed to them just because it was fun and they used to spray it and now they're not going to spray it anymore. I hope that after I show them five or six other species that they'll just hang up all their spray equipment. Next slide. So I've got a video of Michael Polarski and he's talking about some dandelions and he says, yeah, last year I kind of dug up a bunch of these and I sold them for $900. <laughs> There's value in those plants. Next slide, please. Black locust, one of uh, the, the superheroes of the permaculture world. Uh, speaking of it being a polite plant, it, it leafs out late spring, giving the soil lots of time to warm up. The leaves are tiny, providing a dappled light, so sunlight still passes through. So it, it's just enough light through, so some of those plants that don't like full sun get just enough. And it's a nitrogen fixer, and it shares readily with all the plants around. So now you don't have to fertilize these plants. Um, the wood that comes from it is like uh, one of the best woods for any kind of outdoor use. It will last about 10 times longer than cedar. The pollen from the blossoms make the very best honey. I, I mean, I could go, it's edible. In fact, uh, that picture on the left, those, those uh, sheep were put into that paddock like about 30 seconds before I took this picture. The thing they went for first was the black locust leaves. They think it's the most delicious. So, I, I mean, I could go on and on for an hour about black locusts. Next slide. Comfrey, this is like a very popular thing in permaculture, but I'm not sure if, is there anybody here who does not know about putting comfrey under a fruit tree? Okay, there's a few people. This is a very popular uh, permaculture techniques, uh, a technique. A lot of times you'll find grass growing under a fruit tree, but the grass is actually competing with the fruit tree. Plant, there's lots of other things you can plant, but comfrey is one of the best. It's not so much an issue here, but in other places, the soils are acidic. You might have a few patches here where the soil is acidic and you're trying to grow a fruit tree. Comfrey will be a calcium accumulator. Fruit trees love calcium. So, and, and then the comfrey will share the calcium. In fact, it exudes the calcium out of its leaves. It has a bunch of medicinal properties. All kinds of animals love to eat it. You can eat it. A lot of people drink comfrey tea. It, it makes an excellent poultice uh, for broken bones and things like that. But it's like, uh, um, but basically, Tons of comfrey under a fruit tree, far better than grass. Next slide, please. Greening the deserts. This is probably one of the most important parts of all the permaculture stuff being done today. Jeff Lawton, Willie Smith, Sepp Holzer, the bigs, all going out to these properties where there is some serious desert action going on. Did you know that the Sahara used to be lush savanna and jungle? It was human agriculture, just poor agriculture practices that converted it to a desert. That's a man-made desert. And you think people are bitching and moaning about cars putting carbon dioxide and other gases into the atmosphere? That desert is causing far more harm to our environment than all of the cars combined. So, greening the deserts. This is a big, big part. And then on top of that, not only are we going around greening deserts and introducing jungles where we have not had one in recorded history, but on top of that, these techniques can be used in this area to help you have a more successful garden with less effort. Next slide, please. This is uh, your Californian. Uh, this is uh, Art Ludwig, who is fantastic. Definitely eco level nine. Um, uh, Art Ludwig has done so much amazing stuff. Of course, he's writing your California code for gray water systems. 
Um, uh, he's just doing tons and tons. He's working so hard for you guys for like zero pay. Geez, go buy the guy's books, will ya? He's got the book, the gray water book, and he's got the water storage book. Just, just support the guy because he's fucking awesome. Art Ludwig. He lives in Santa Barbara. Yeah, and so, um, so there's all the stuff that he's done, and he, and 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 it's like he's got. I've got a great podcast with him, where basically he says that in order to change the world, you have to break the law. And and basically the legislators know that, and so he's currently writing the gray water law for the state of of California. But he but it had to come by him first breaking the law, and demonstrating it so that the lawmakers could come and see it, understand it, and then still be like, okay, dude, you need to write the laws because we're kind of like not getting it, and obviously you know your shit. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> All right, uh, but here's, he's got this article up on his website. Can a 4,000 square foot home be green? And basically in it, he points out that in 1950, the average floor area for a family of four was 1,000 square feet. In 2000, it's 2,200 square feet. So um, a lot of the stuff that he talks about, it's like, you know, imagine living in a boat, how, how efficiently people live in boats. And on top of that, consider for a moment living in a tiny piece of art versus um, a large conventional space. And I think a lot of us in this room would prefer the tiny piece of art over the large conventional space. It's just, you know, let's, let's explore it. Because when you start doing that, in fact, in New York City, the average electricity usage per person is less than half of the United States average. But I think that's because it's so crazy expensive that people live in these tiny spaces. Very, very efficient. Granted, here in San Diego, it's like the weather's so mild, it's like, ah, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> We're gonna use the same energy no matter how big our small house is. But then, you know, maybe if you're heating it this time of year, well, you might like think about a smaller space. But uh, can a 4,000 square foot home be green? Uh, my first response to that, and I got the podcast talking to him about this very article. Yes, if you've got 12 people living in it. And I'm gonna touch on that in a moment too. Next slide, please. Legionella. Um, I believe 92% of all of the solar hot water systems installed in England are now being ripped out because they cause Legionella. Who here has had or knows somebody who has had um, no, 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 the, 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 the one where your lungs fill with water, pneumonia. Who here has had pneumonia? Okay, just for those who've had pneumonia, I want you to go and check the temperature on your water heater. It should be at 140. There may have been a time when somebody said you'll save energy if you turn it down. The amount of energy you save is like minuscule but your odds of getting pneumonia just went up through the roof. You've created a Legionella bacteria incubator. Congratulations, you're giving everybody pneumonia. Turn your heat up. Those, your hot water heater should be super insulated. It'll make almost no difference at all. You'll use less hot water now that the temperature is, is higher. And it's gonna be super insulated, so it turns out the amount of energy you use is pretty, uh, the difference is insignificant, but now how much does it cost to get pneumonia? It's pretty damn expensive. So, um, I, I one time about four years ago, I saw a guy putting together a presentation, he was presenting to like 20 different people about this interesting uh, solar hot water tube, and it was really quite fascinating. But I think that the key is, is that since most solar hot water systems encourage Legionella, then it's like that's part of the design process. You have to have a design that prevents Legionella or at least considers Legionella and will keep it at bay. So it's not, you're not just incubating, incubating Legionella. And since it featured clear glass, which could then possibly get algae in the system, and the algae could then feed the Legionella, I was curious, so I asked him. He had never heard of it. So, this is four years ago before I was famous, so I, I tried to um, ask him about it. The people in the audience um, shushed me and told me to leave, and that they didn't want to hear about it. 
So, now that I'm famous, Legionella, motherfuckers! <laughs> Next! I made a video with Toby Hemingway, which I thought was really amazing, and hardly anybody ever watched it. And um, in permaculture circles, we get a lot of people who start talking about native plants. And native plants are important, and I think all permaculture systems do include native plants. I, don't, I can't think of a permaculture system that I've seen that didn't. Um, but I imagine it's possible that some do. But, but the, a lot of people that are, that, are, that are powerful, keen on native plants seem to believe that you should only plant native plants. Um, and my first question to them is, what do you eat? And it turns out that a lot of the native plant advocates, nearly all of them, um, eat food that is not native, at least a little bit every week. And most of them, most of them eat like 99% of their diet is not native. So it's kind of like, okay, well, here's the deal. We're giving people an opportunity to do permaculture in their yards and they're gonna grow a lot of food. They might even be able to grow like half, if not all, of the food that they eat. It's possible, it's been done. But like, let's say that they grow only natives, of which there's very little that, that is either palatable or that you know, can produce a lot of food. Then that means that in order for them to be able to stay alive eating food and things like that, that farmers are gonna go and have to rip up like three to six acres of native habitat in order to be able to feed that person um, who was, just has a quarter of an acre of, uh, of a piece of land with a house on it. So all I want to do is I want to encourage the natives, but like, you know, I want to encourage the food more than the natives. So let's not like bash all of the food plants just for the sake of natives, because it's like it's been, and then the other thing I want to point out too is that nearly all native organizations are encouraged strongly by pesticide companies because the, one of the biggest buyers of herbicides, such as Roundup, are native plant organizations. All right, and now a lot of native plant organizations were funded by people that would never buy an herbicide, but mysteriously these other people show up and next thing you know, oh, the fastest way to solve this problem of the non-native plants being invasive is to go and spray them with herbicides. Where did these people come from? Where did these herbicide fiends come from? It couldn't possibly be that Monsanto has hired them to go and hang out and vote in these organizations, is it? I'm not fucking around, they really do that. All right, next slide please. All right, so this is something I wanna get. This is actually this slide and the next slide. So uh, 20 people living under one roof without anybody getting stabbed. So I mean, I hope that everybody here can see the advantages of 20 people living under one roof, but we all have tried like three or four people living under one roof. Hell, half of us in the audience have tried this mysterious, bizarre thing called marriage, and that's just two people living under one roof. And, and a lot of us are baffled that we didn't end up getting stabbed. <laughs> So now the thing is, is that uh, I spend, for, for all the other things in permaculture, for all the other things, um, I, I believe that that's like 10 pounds. For just the whole concept of 20 people living under one roof without getting stabbed, that's 200 pounds. Then to talk about the ethics, that's infinite pounds. That's why I kind of get frustrated when people say, oh, you can't talk about the, um, the, the, the agricultural aspects of permaculture until first you've fully digested the ethics. I'm thinking, hell, people have been talking about ethics for thousands of years and we still don't have it worked out. So, um, but I could rant on the ethics of permaculture for probably six hours, but I've already got that out of permies if you're really interested in that. But here, 20 people under one roof without anybody getting stabbed. So here we've got uh, 10 households uh, uh, each with two people in each household. And of course, you know, some households will have one person and some households will have five people and stuff like that. But then the thing is, is that if we can get 20 people to live under one roof, then you can have an awesome meal three times a day cooked by somebody else. And then somebody else is doing the dishes. Once in a while you'll do the dishes. Once in a while you'll help with the cooking. Um, but here's another thing too, is I once was in a community house. We had all organic or better food. Um, and our food bill was $108 per person per month. And each of us had to cook 
uh, two meals per week, but we got 14 meals per week that were awesome. And uh, so, so just, and then great community. Everybody in the house um, had completed a PDC. Um, and so we talked about permaculture at the table all the time. Um, it, was, it was rather dreamy, but of course, community has its downsides. <laughs> the key is, is that there are ways, we're working on ways to mitigate those downsides. And it's not the traditional things you might be thinking of which have been proven to fail. We've got new things to try. All I want to do is to take the slide for a moment to say, we're working on it. And it but consider, just think about it, as crazy as it sounds, just keep in mind the upsides. I mean, where we're staying now, Right now with um, Kevin and, and with, we've got um, Alden and Ann nearby and uh, Jason's there. And it's like, this is an extremely tight-knit community. In fact, I've got a lot of problems at Permies with people that I call the hate in the name of love crowd. This, this particular community is definitely doing the legit love thing. I mean, it's like, I, I've heard, yeah, thanks community. I've heard from a lot of different people that are staying either on this property or around here, and it's like, wow. I mean, what, talk about close-knit and positive. It's a very rare thing. Most of what I see are people who talk about love all the time, but really they hate each other. <laughs> and, and so um, when we have a lot of problems, they come in there on the permies and they say, you should all love each other. And in fact, because you're not loving that guy the way I demand you to, I have to fuck up your shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, all right, so we're working on Next slide is going to show the, the big house. Plus, the other thing is, is that when you've got uh, uh, 20 people under one roof, you can live far more luxuriously with half the eco footprint. You use half the energy. Far less food is wasted. The food is way better. Um, but, but everything that we're concerned about, about being eco, is way reduced. Fewer couches are purchased. But the inside, everything is far more luxurious. So your average footprint is half. OK, Sepp Holzer's Ag Designs can feed 21 billion people without fertilizer or irrigation. That world hunger thing fucking solved. Yeah. It's done. It's over. Throughout this, this day, throughout this presentation, we've solved energy problems. Most wars come from energy problems. A lot of our pollution comes from energy problems. A lot of our uh, corporate ickiness Bad guys doing bad things come from energy problems. And we fucking solved that. The food problem solved that. So we've been solving all kinds of problems. It's just a matter of getting people connected to the information. 21 billion people can be fed without petroleum or irrigation. Next slide, please. In 1950, there was one pediatric oncology unit, so children's cancer ward. Today, there are over 200. We bathe daily in an ocean of toxins and carcinogens, which we have not yet scientifically proven are toxins and carcinogens. The eggs served in a pediatric oncology unit are dehydrated eggs from chickens fed pesticide-laced foods raised in a horrible environment. We could go there and be angry, but I think it's far better to keep sharing the information that we're sharing. Pass it on as much as we can, day after day. It's boring, I know, but it's very important. The fact that we have so many children dying of cancer should be a powerful indicator that we're doing something wrong. And the solution just turns out to be that shaking your fist at bad guys isn't really doing the trick. However, we have other means, and it's a much smoother ride to go and tell somebody about an idea than it is to go and be angry at them. Next slide, please. Amen. Rather than being angry at bad guys, I want to share a thousand bricks for building a better world. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you for coming.
Thank you. <laughs>